Hello, everybody, and welcome. We are about to get started, so please put on your headsets and welcome to the stage your host and MC for the event, Jacob Lindahl. Hello, hello. Hi, my name is Jacob. This is the Doom Slug stage where we're going to have technical topics and panels. Welcome to NearCon 2022. Woo! A reminder, this is a silent disco event, so you'll see we have the headsets scattered around. Make sure you put those on so you can hear what's going on on stage and you don't have to worry about the background noise, all right? Um, reminder, the hashtag for NearCon is hashtag NearCon, so make sure to use that, spread it around. We have over, 20, or over 2,000 attendees here, so make sure that you meet the person sitting next to you, say hi, and just enjoy the event. Let me welcome up our first panel here. It's called Staking on Near Steady Yields Secure Network. It's moderated by Matt Siegel, and here we have Diraj, Igor, and Claudio. Take it away, Matt. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. It's really nice to see everybody. I feel very close to you, given that you've got me right in your ear. Um, we're going to jump right in. I'm going to give um, our panelists about 30 seconds each to introduce themselves. Um, and then we'll start with questions. My name is uh, Matthew Siegel. I'm a technical writer at, at NIR. Um, and we'll start with uh, Claudio on the right. On hey, my thank left. Thank you very much. Me. Hey, everybody. My name is Claudio. I'm co founder of Metapult, the first liquid staking solution on NIR and Aurora. And we're basically one of the uh, first assets that are going to be used in custodial services. More to come on that uh, on the proximity talk. So don't miss that one. Hi guys, I'm Igor, head of Incor company. We are doing blockchain development and blockchain staking since 2018. We joined it near from early testnet, validating near like literally for two years already. Uh, we are running all validators, bare metal servers, uh, hardware solution, like real servers with staking with uh, validating with uh, proposals and uh, all this funny stuff which you can have only with common line interface um, this pretty awesome um, hey guys um, Deeraj, the co-founder of uh, state of protocol essentially we are a multi-chain liquid staking protocol and we offer liquid staking plus a little more on six blockchains today and uh, we have been live on the near blockchain our liquid staking token is nearx Awesome. Thanks, gentlemen. So just by a show of hands, how many of you are confident you could explain staking to another person if you were asked to do it? That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, I've been asking a lot of people about it. It seems there's some confusion. So hopefully we'll get to clear some of that up today. So the first question I'm going to ask my panelists is, how do you explain this to somebody who's relatively new to the space? that might not have a ton of technical knowledge. I'll, I'll start with Claudio and then maybe we can move through. Yeah, sure. But for us, is we've been doing a lot of education from the beginning. So we launched on August 23rd last year. And a lot of the initial conversation is why do liquid staking? So we first had to explain what staking is. Which one's better? For us, the first and foremost and most important thing about staking is how you secure a proof of stake network. This is an activity that is anybody that holds near should do, bar none. Even if you use liquid staking or you stake directly into a validator node, what we say is like, you just now have a near token. If you want to secure and add value to that token, the first thing that you need to do is stake, which is a delegation process to the network so it's more secure, more decentralized, and more censorship resistant. So awesome. Igor, you have anything you want to add to that? Yeah, so as exactly mentioned, it's delegated proof of stake. So first of all, staking. While you run blockchain or distributed ledger solution or database solution, it means literal like distributed. So you have the same instances which should synchronize with each other. And you want to be decentralized, which means different people control all these nodes. And you want to have incentivization mechanism for these people to run these nodes. So from staking means like, you stake your coins in validator, which secures the network, validates the transaction, create new blocks, create new proposal, and for this, new coin emission comes to your validator. It's a part of this coin's emission. 
and exactly the more amount of coins staked in the protocol, the more secure protocol is. Because to have some kind of attack, you will need literally to double the amount of coins. Lit to be exact, 66.6%, .6%, but wherever. So it's a security of network. The more tokens secure it, the harder for other people to do a malicious attack process. That's why you want to have nodes which owned by different people, put in different countries. Internet can sometimes work not as expected. Your provider cannot work as expected. Bare metal servers sometimes just go away. It's decentralization, it's security. You provide value to network and network incentivize you with profit. That's great, so this is mutually beneficial. Diraj, we, we had a great conversation before we started. Um, you had some great comparisons talking about banking a little bit. Do you want to get into that a little for us? Yeah, yes, of course. Um, so the way I look at staking is it has a, a set of benefits for the blockchain, a set of benefits for people who are putting their money into it, and a set of benefits for the validators. But my simplest analogy uh, for staking would be it's, it's kind of like a savings account, right? You put in some near with a protocol or validators, and after, after a certain period of time, you have more near, right? It's, it's, it's accrued interest on top of the near that you have put in. And um, the only constraint I would add to that is when you take your money out, you know, it has an unbonding period, essentially like a constraint uh, of say two days. And uh, that's essentially how I would describe staking on near. Uh, what Claudia mentioned and Igor mentioned, all of that is completely true. I think uh, from the validator side, from the blockchain side, there's a lot of, uh, you know, securing the network, there's a lot of value addition that happens through staking in terms of long-term incentivization of the, of the blockchain. But for a normal user, all you need to know is staking a savings account with, with a constraint. Yeah, that's a great explanation. Um, I don't know how many of you have heard of yield farming. It was a term that, that confused me a little bit when I heard it. But yield farming is, correct me if I'm wrong, is the overarching idea, right? And beneath that is staking, liquid staking, and such, is that correct? Cool. So um, we heard proof of stake come up. Um, maybe we can talk a little bit about how staking is directly related to proof of stake. Maybe we'll start at this end. Yeah, so uh, proof of stake at the end of the day is, is, is a consensus mechanism, right? And what I mean by that is a blockchain is obviously run by a diverse set of machines or nodes across geographies. And for all of these machines to arrive at a single result, and believe that that result is true, there is a consensus mechanism, and that is proof of stake. So uh, on every single block, there is a single machine that proposes a new block that says, hey, this is the truth, and everybody should follow this truth. And uh, the way this machine is decided is through the amount of stake that this machine holds, or the validator holds. And uh, obviously that stake is, is a combination of the funds that the validator has put in, to staking and for and the funds from normal users that have trusted the validator to do the right thing, and and this is you know uh, also a simpler concept. Yes, that's great. Do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, it's pretty. Easy. So staking exists. Delegated proof of staking means your coin stays on your wallet, which is like big difference in year because it's once again layer of security. While you stake your coins, like with proof of stake, you literally move your coins to node. And the private keys are coins there. Something happens, hard disk drive burns, uh, I know, like your server compromised, somebody brute force through root access, you lose your coin. With near, you are delegating your coins, which means you just move in your voting power and your coin stays on your wallet. If something happens with validator or you are not happy with their behavior or just like disappear, you just revoke your coins and in few epochs you will have them back. Nothing can happen with your coins. You are fully controlled with what is going on. That's great. Do you want to jump in on that? Yeah, I think Igor touched on a very important aspect, right? The, the custodial, non-custodial side. That's very important. That's something that as an ecosystem we need to remind because we, we're kind of like in a bubble, right? And then. And everybody, most of you understand custodial, non-custodial, but for people or normies coming in, this is a very important aspect, right? That you are always in control of your assets. And this is something that for Web 2.0 users coming into the Web 3 space, it's something that it takes time to grasp. And more importantly, the responsibility of 
owning your assets, mm -hmm. that if yes, you do a bad transaction, then things can go sideways pretty quick. So, so anyhow, so I think the custodial and non-custodial side is something very important that the proof of stake solution that NIR provides is really, really robust and something that we're really bullish upon. Yeah, that's great. So um, a couple of you mentioned wallets. Maybe we can talk about hardware wallets a little bit. Do any of you guys want to jump in on that? Do any of you have strong you opinions on hardware wallets? <laughs> um, yeah, so like hardware wallets exist, Ledger is fine. Uh, you can, if you want, you can create your own. So like literally hardware wallets is uh, once again layer of security and there is uh, options to sign transactions with your hardware wallet. So if you want to have a custody solution, which I think Metapool will have soon, or any partner integrated it, it's moving your assets to custody. But there's like a lot of people who are really heavy on security, on owning their coins, and the hardware wallet is the one way of doing this. So MetaMask is fine, Near Wallet is fine, all the wallets, like, you can go with wallet.near.org, it's literally store your private key in local storage. Mm -hmm. And going to, you know, what hardware wallet you love, like Ledger, Ledger definitely work with Near. You can go to stake and you can sign transaction from Ledger, and you are totally sure that your private key are on this small, like, USB drive stuff, which is, once again, another level of control. So your computer can be hijacked, your computer can be compromised. A lot of stuff happens on your PC. I don't, like, real control freaks have the separate PC exactly for crypto. So literally it's a notebook only for crypto stuff. Sometimes they literally delete everything except some basic level components. And Ledger just move everything on a different, different layer. So you can do whatever stupid stuff you want to do with your PC until you will sign transaction with your Ledger you are fine. And like signing transaction with your ledger is, it literally asks you a few times, do you want to sign this transaction? Mm. Um, so hardware layer, uh, ledgers, uh, hardware wallets exist, an actual layer of security. Just, if you want it, you can have it. It's not obligatory for staking. And anything we say is not financial advice, folks, please. So Purely be, educational. Do, do your own research. Uh, but anyhow, just, just sorry to, to interrupt there. But then, and this is what I'm talking about education as well, right? Custodial, non-custodial, like Ledger or any hardware wallet brings another level of security, but also an, a higher level of responsibility, right? How many of us has lost a USB drive in the uh, last 15 years? Everybody. Ledger or Trezor or whatever is the same size. So you have to be like triple, four times careful because you are basically having thousands of dollars or, so, or for some high network individual millions of dollars on just one USB drive. So that's a whole level of responsibility that I myself, like I delegate that to somebody else. That's why I do custodial yeah, services. It, it's always a question about your exposure to risk. If yeah. you want to see how it works and you are operating with one year, which is close to five bucks right now, you can do whatever you want. You do not need to create security level. If you're operating with big amount of money, you can go to another layer of encryption. If you are enterprise grade solution, if you are institution investors, there is a custody solution, Fireblocks, uh, Fireblocks, BitGo, Bitgo Finoa, uh, Fino like Copper, Pigment. For every pocket size, there is a proper solution. And you need to just do research if you want to stake millions of dollars from a USB drive, it's a little bit crazy stuff. <laughs> And like, it's still USB flash drive. <laughs> so even if you cannot sign transaction for malicious purpose, you can lose it, it can be easily damaged, it's still made of plastic, um, it's wiring and electricity, some kind of, I know, like short circuit and it's dead. Yeah, you have like backup trays with uh, like 12 boards, all this stuff, Metal, it's still yeah. written on a paper with your pencil, it can be burned away and uh, you need to do your own research and to be responsible with your funds all the time. Yeah, did you want to add anything to that or did that feel pretty good to you? That's, that's a pretty extensive answer. Awesome, yeah. I, I heard one of you mention experimenting with a small amount. Did one of you say that? Being able to put like one near and just kind of playing around and seeing how it works? Yeah. I think that's, that's always a good idea. Um, you know, that's a small amount of money to lose if, even if you were to lose. And that's a uh, hundred times faster, better than reading about everything. That's awesome. 
So we talked a little bit about uh, why staking is necessary, um, but I had a number of people tell me that as soon as you get your near, stake it immediately. So are you all under the impression that everybody should be doing this kind of right away, or is it something that is not really for everybody? Yeah, so I can, I can start with that. Um, I think staking is for everybody. Staking has see, staking is of great importance to the blockchain too. And honestly, it's one of the, the first steps uh, any, any normal user into crypto space would, would take. Uh, I would suggest everybody stake. Um, what I would suggest also is not stopping at staking, right? There's a lot more, lot more ways to make money off, off your near, and uh, obviously awareness around how to generate more yields, liquid staking, yield farming, all of these are good steps. That's great, thank you. So I think it would be useful for us to talk a little bit about security since we all care about that a great deal. Um, what can be done to keep the network secure um, and making it more secure as we go on? I mean, we talked a little bit about hardware wallets and some of the challenges that come with that, but, but what do you guys think about when you're thinking about security on near? Igor, let's start with you and then we'll go this way. Is that, is that cool? Yeah, I would just go come back to previous questions. So the idea is you have near coins. First question, where, how do you get it? Like, if you are happy with holding near, you can hold it. No big deal. If you want to have a stable yield based on the security of network, nothing more, you can stake it with validator. You can just literally do it from your wallet. Choose anyone you like, everything inside, percent amount, amount of money staked. Uh, you can see like top 10 validators will have like 35 plus percent of network. It will warn you do not stake with these guys, stake with the smaller guys to make it more decentralized. Next level is going to DeFi solution, which is definitely liquid staking is also a play in the game. Like staking is easy. Liquid staking, you need to figure out what is going on. Like you exchange your token to another token and it's fast, but what is the exit procedure? What amount of token can go out next day? What you can do with new tokens? Do they have a governance tokens or do they have not? What is the government's token about? What is the utility? What's the roadmap of the team? Who is the team? So it's already like staking with near. You just need to investigate the near team and make like you are happy with this. Staking with DeFi solution, you need to figure out who is this team, how long they in the space, what their expertise is. And once again, it's about utility. So you can go to another layer of DeFi. So you can stake with liquid staking pool, take your token, go to borrowing, uh, lending protocol, leverage yield farming, wherever you want. That's pretty it. So you can hold it. It's always about your risk exposure. Mm. You can even, you got your near, how you got it? Somebody send it for fun? Or maybe you put your Bitcoin as collateral to bureau protocol, borrowed near, and now having this near cost you something because you're already paying for borrowing capital. Um, that's it. So. Staking is security level for blockchain. So definitely you should start with this. But there is like a normal approach how you can do this. Got it, got it. Did you? Did either of you guys want to jump in on this? So one important aspect of it is they need to understand that one, in order for NIR to become more valuable, it needs to improve its Nakamoto coefficient, which is how you measure the level of decentralization of a proof of stake network. And right now, to be honest, it's like, we need to do a lot of work as an ecosystem to better that, not, that, that coefficient. So yes, staking directly with validator, validator nodes that are outside the top 10, that's a must do. That will incentivize the new token holders to do a little bit of research, who are the validator nodes. As an ecosystem, we need to do a much better job at exposing node operators, such as Inc. Inc. 4, right? So, uh, and then there's the nor normal one, Bison Trails, you got Dragonfly, you got a bunch of the other uh, VC firms on, uh, that are running nodes. And then when, if you want to get exposure to a liquid asset, understand why are you doing it as well, right? Um, yes, it is important to research the background of the team, right? I know that in Web3 it's fine for, people, uh, for projects to be uh, pseudonymous, anonymous, right? But at the end of the day, that comes with a risk. And so for, if we want to onboard the new generation of crypto usage, they will need this kind of like background check on the team because that's what they expect, right, from Web 2.0. You cannot expect them to drink the Web 3 Kool-Aid and expect for them to put in some of their savings on a pseudonymous or anonymous protocol, right? 
So they need to put a face into it. How long has it been run? How many audit has it gotten? Have there been any security incidents on the protocol? And all those things, as an ecosystem, we need to be totally transparent and put that information out there for people to do their own research, right? And so I think that's one, first and foremost, very important to be out there. Transparency on the information, clarity on the information, and more importantly, digestible. Because to be honest, we talk a lot of jargon, we talk a lot of buzzwords, and those are buzzwords that no normal user, user is gonna understand. So that's, for me, and for, the most important thing is education about the risks, about how to do the due diligence, and I understand on how to make that research That's be awesome. effective. That's awesome. So um, before we get into uh, the questions about you know learning the hard way and some of the other questions that uh, I have that I have here, can any of you explain the whole coin pairing thing? Because that that seems like something that can be confusing for people. Do any of you have a good explanation for that? Want to go? I'm sorry. What what is coin pairing? What is coin pairing? That's so I'm probably in the audience on this question. Uh, no, so th this is uh, this is the related to the depegging, right? So how do you oh. keep how do you keep the peg to the liquid asset, right? And this depends basically, and and this is a little bit. I'm gonna. This will require somebody that understands information architecture and how and the design of a smart contract. How we do it in Metapool is we try to keep it really easy. How do we avoid depegging and keep always the price of ST near stable? How we do it is basically we have a big pool of delegated near. We calculate the price on the amount of near there and the staking rewards being generated. And that is being updated on the smart contract every 13 hours. So that's how we keep, we avoid the risk of the depegging of the asset. And then that's why, or at least for ST near, is a good asset to use for borrowing and lending because it's a self accruing in value asset every 13 hours. So it's just, it's like a self-paying loan if you go to borrow cash or you go to Origami or to Bastion or we're in Aurora as well. And so, and it's a very easy thing for people to dismiss, but it's the core or maybe one of the biggest risks that you have as a liquid staking platform, that your price of the, of the liquid token be pegged from, 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 from the base asset which is near. And so, at least for us, the design is really simple. Uh, and so we've been yeah, very successful for the past 12 months that we've been on mainnet, so really happy about that. So anyhow. That's a great answer. Yeah, one of the things uh, that stated uh, we have done, essentially on other blockchains that uh, we're gonna do very soon on here, is you know, creating redundancies for, uh, for calculating the price spec, right? Um, we obviously offer the official price spec through our smart contracts, and what we have done is also uh, partnered up with oracles like Chainlink uh, with, with, uh, with, with other folks to essentially understand what the price point is. And we've been transparent about how to fetch this information, you know, uh, whatever we do in the smart contract is something that you guys can, can do too. So this information is completely transparent, but creating uh, layers of redundancy around, you know, misinformation, uh, network outages, uh, all of this is very crucial, especially for a token like liquid, like a liquid staking token. Right, and what Claudio mentioned is, is very valid. Uh, uh, it's the simpler these are, the better. Uh, but I definitely think we need layers of redundancy here. That's great. Anything you want to add to that? Yeah. So idea like liquid staking is literally like staking, which means token which you put in this protocol are staked, and no magic happens. It's a protocol. While you want to stake something, it took you to Epoch. It's like five, 55 up to sixty hours, and if you want to unstake the same amount of time like three days and they mint another token in exchange of your token and they create a trading pair on DEX which means to provide this so we figure out what the staking is what's the liquid like how it comes so there is additional liquidity provider who are always willing to buy your staked interest bearing token with real tokens and they charge small amount of fee for this so the pegging means they need to have a liquidity pair in DEXs. They need to have strong liquidity providers there because if you have like 10,000 bucks liquidity, it's not liquidity. It means the smart contract should be solid, no artificial minting. Some guys have a small incident before, like a few weeks ago, and some bad guys just minted enormous amount of this stake tokens, which comes to small collapse, but they solve it like literally very fast. Team respond really fast. So, 
liquidity comes with price. Mm -hmm. If it will be for free, uh, you should think about nothing in crypto is free. Right. So to have your token liquid and to have your tokens staked and interest bearing, but also with an option to have immediately possibility to withdraw, it costs you something. Exchange rate like 0.3% on DEX, either um, protocol profit which are charged by staking protocol, and moreover, there is like two types of providing this uh, interest bearing assets, uh, which uh, on Metapool, you are own part of the pool of the stake stake at near so you do not need to go to the protocol every day and click claim 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 yield after compound all this stuff so literally you own the percent of the pool and while the amount of money in the pool increase you still own the person so your token is tradable to against higher value which means in case of staked ethereum from metapel you don't want to have peg your interest bearing token is always increasing in price against near assets. So pegging is more about like old school Ethereum liquid staking. Mm -hmm. In near it's like, it's way too fast. Near is cheap, it's fast, uh, block time like zero, uh, 1.5 seconds, uh, transaction with uh, ultra low cost. They can do enormous amount of stuff under the hood and it will cost you peanuts, I know like less than five cents, less than cents. Yeah, thank you so much. So before we get to the final question, I have one specifically for, for Claudio. Before we started, you were mentioning, um, you were talking a little bit about how staking, uh, liquid staking is, is very important in developing countries. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yes, so this next couple of uh, 18 months, 24 months, this bear market is something that has um, spark a lot of interest in developing countries. <clears throat> because right now, it's not expensive for somebody in Latin America or in Africa to get exposed to near, right? Um, and so one of the big things that we're pushing for is how, do, how does liquid staking create a passive income for anybody at a reasonable price point? Right now, f uh, financial instruments for anybody that uh, is earning less than $100 a week is out of, out of the question, right? With liquid staking, that's something that's really approachable by anybody, right? They can just stake one year or half a year, right? And then get the, the APY on that. The 10% is way, way, you're, 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 you're protecting yourself from inflation when you do that, right? Because if, for example, if you live in Argentina or in Venezuela, like my friend Fritz over there, you know, that's 10% inflation every week. People don't put prices on things. Why? Because next week is going to be more expensive, as easy as that. And so how do you hedge that? And we believe that liquid staking will be a very important asset that any proof of stake network should bring to developing countries and start to do a much better way of educating around how this can become passive income for them. Yeah, that's a great answer. We didn't talk about this, you, uh, either of you, but do either of you have thoughts on this? I, I, I think, uh yeah, uh, see, staking is a very approachable product. Um, it's it's a very simple product, and I feel with the convenience liquid staking offers, um, I completely agree with Claudio. I think there's really no reason why people should not get into the staking game, and it's it's honestly a great uh, introduction to the crypto ecosystem. And with Near, which is you know crucial uh, in in the blockchain ecosystem, yeah, probably the best way to get started. Awesome, awesome. So we only have about a minute and a half left. I just want to open it up to any of you if you have closing thoughts, things that you wanted to get off your chest, uh, feelings about Lisbon, anything that's on your mind as before we finish up. Igor, you got something? Or Diraj, any of you? Yeah, so uh, as, as a follow-up, right, if you are completely new to crypto, check out staking. Check out liquid staking. You have uh, multiple options on, on liquid staking on Near. We have Stater, we have Metapool, we have Linear. Uh, all of these are great protocols to stake with. Uh, each of us have our own nuances, but uh, you'll learn more about it as you follow along. Uh, that's probably it. Enjoy, enjoy the sun while you're in Lisbon, whenever you see it. <laughs> um, cool. I, anything you want to jump in with, Igor? Yeah, like, New York is a great place to interact and learn something. You won't lose all your money immediately. You can play with small amount of transaction, like, Transaction do not cost you like hundreds of bucks like in Ethereum. Transaction are fast, you do not need to wait hours like in Bitcoin. 
transactions are pretty transparent. Uh, a lot of protocols are building on this. A lot of people here. If you want to know more about uh, staking, liquid staking, find me on a boost, liquid staking, find Claudio on a boost. We are available here like next three, four days. Definitely want to chat about staking, near liquid staking, DeFi, yields, and all this nice stuff. It's true, chat them up. Do you have five seconds for something? Yes, yeah, so, so def we launched MetaYield, which is a crowdfunding platform that leverages a liquid token. Basically, you exchange your near staking rewards for project tokens, so check us out at the booth there. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming to our talk. Yeah, great seeing you here. Yeah, I just want to say also very briefly, um, try not to be too intimidated by the vocabulary, right? Because I think that can turn off a lot of people when you see all these unfamiliar words. If you take a little time, talk to these gentlemen, do a little bit of research, it's a lot easier than you think it could be. Again, thank you all so much for being here. I hope you have a beautiful, beautiful near con and um, enjoy yourselves. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Awesome. Thank you. You guys were great. Thanks, Matthew. Really Appreciate good. It. Thank, you. thank you. All right. Thank nice you guys so much. Thank you guys. See you guys around. What an amazing, amazing panel that was. So much information. Thank you so much, Matt. Thank you, Igor, Claudio, and Diraj. Wow, so much information about liquid staking, security. What in the world is staking and how does Nier use it? And uh, yeah, so thank you so much for all of that information. Quick reminder, this is the Doom Slug stage where we have technical workshops at, or technical panels and talks. Um, this is one of three stages active right now. We also have the layer one stage for ecosystem-wide talks and the nightshade stage for some more focused workshops and sessions. My name is Jacob, I'm the MC here, and let me welcome up our next speaker who is talking about Spaceport, your landing pad of the near ecosystem, Alina Tusanova from Inc4. Thank you for having me again this year. It's a great pleasure to join you here today. Um, let's meet. My name is Alina. I am the Chief Operating Officer of Inc4, a blockchain development company that incorporated in Ukraine. Um, before I get into the actual subject of today's presentation, I'd like to give a little background on who we are and what we do to those of you that we haven't had a chance to meet yet. So the INC4 is a strong team of engineers building on blockchain, and uh, so far, NIR is our number one favorite. Well, I'm pretty sure that all of you know why NIR is awesome. Obviously, that's why you're all here. Um, so how it all started? Our first acquaintance with the NEAR protocol took place back in the end of 2020. Uh, the INC4 was trusted to become the development team for building the Open Forest protocol. That's an open source blockchain-based MRV system uh, destined to host the forestry project. At that time, we've been invited and, uh, well, we thought, it was sustainability, like it was something that we really wanted to go with. And by the way, if you haven't heard about the Open Forest Protocol yet, just visit their booth, the Open Forest Protocol, right on your right from this place and uh, meet the team because these are the guys who's gonna be leading the carbon economy on chain soon. So after one and a half years of intense development, we now have the OFP live on the mainnet, successfully onboarding forestry projects, and uh, we are pretty sure that this is yet the start of a tremendous journey that the team has ahead. And once again, well, the CEO of Fred Fournier and uh, the Open Forest Protocol team, thank you for your trust, and uh, we'll make sure to go on not letting you down here. So after a few months of development, we have received an invitation to join the, in, uh, the NEAR Guild program. Um, we became the first development guild to help the community grow the ecosystem. We started developing various dApps, landings, blogs, uh, I don't know what, DAOs, anything that would actually do for the ecosystem to help them grow the exposure of the near protocol to the world. I must say from my own experience, uh, with guild participation, it was definitely a success story at that time. Having gained enough development expertise in NIR, we understood that we want to move further. We have our own ideas on how to accelerate the protocol's movement towards a stronger and 
more purposeful market competition. We just need to facilitate. Us, like all of us uh, builders on NIR, need to facilitate the young protocol's exposure to the users out there who dedicate their funds and investment capitals to other networks. This is why the INFOR, with the help of the NIR Grants program, introduced the first leveraged yield farming protocol on NIR, having gained almost $6 million worth TVL within just two months upon launch. Because we knew that there were farmers and lenders out there who wanted to go with uh, new promising beneficial blockchain if they were just provided with such an opportunity. Exactly for the same reason, the Infor built the RPC provider and the near node benchmark service so that we knew that facilitation for developers who build on near is a great must have for the ecosystem. Now, there's much more to it actually. The near ecosystem has grown exponentially since its launch. I mean, look at the numbers, they are impressive, right? But come dive deeper with me. I'm gonna do some reading now, like apologizing for that, but please bear with me. So diving deeper. The holy grail on any L1 ecosystem is to onboard the first billion users into the internet of value. Originally, this went with users purchasing and selling the native tokens like ERC20, like NFT one for one, but has since grown to involve NFT marketplaces, uh, governance projects, and uh, play to earn games. So the chain play platform conducted e research, the state of game five 2022 survey and uh, the results showed that 75% of respondents actually started investing into crypto assets through GameFi just because they were familiar with it, just because it was a comfortable environment for, their, for them to start in. And this tells a lot, though it doesn't even cover institutions actually. So notably, while many in one ecosystems continue to develop, many questions remain pertaining to access for users and to exposure for the ecosystem projects. In short, how are non-crypto native users ever going to be using a product that presupposes technical crypto knowledge to start? Uh, conversely, to what extent do ecosystem projects actually depend on active users in order to survive? This is the challenge common to all crypto projects and uh, it has not been resolved in a satisfactory manner. So at the same time, we have a paradox of sorts emerging out of this twofold challenge. So the near ecosystem and the many near native tokens remain relatively non-accessible to most non-crypto native users, while near nevertheless, possesses one of the most user-friendly structure, user structure designs. Can this paradox actually be resolved? So let's outline the user benefits of the account structure of NIR before actually delving into the main issues pertaining to access and exposure within the ecosystem. In the crowded L1 landscape, user defines itself as an asynchronous sharded blockchain designed to scale with an equally strong focus on user experience. Specifically, the near account model is focal here for understanding the user-centric design of the near protocol. Unlike other L1 ecosystems, uh, near implemented the account IDs to the user address. The users can send value only to other registered addresses. Transaction fees cannot be overpaid with the difference being actually returned back to the user's balance. Progressive security for the user account means that the near account can be backed up with email, phone number, and two-factor authentication. And there is much more to it planned ahead, like 
removing the explicit account address before you actually get the man readable address, which is really important for onboarding non crypto natives, like signing up with a face ID or a fingerprint, right? Like easy access, like um, covering the fees on other users' behalf, and so on. That's like, I know that there's a lot planned in here, like for the upcoming development. So, most importantly, the near account model allows for the user to transfer access uh, of its account through generation and burning of private access keys. This means that access to a near account can be added or removed without having the user or an entity actually uncover the existing private key. While the aforementioned technical designs of the near account model are well known within the near ecosystem, it has not been adequately exposed in relation to improving ecosystem access to non-crypto natives and interested institutions. In this sense, exposure in the near ecosystem is severely limited. To be concise, the near ecosystem projects and services they are totally underdeveloped, pertain to four directions. Institutional access to the ecosystem projects and services, custody of the near assets, market and product access to non-crypto native users, and liquidity for the, na for the native tokens. As it stands, it is difficult for institutional investors to purchase and custody near no tokens. It is difficult for users to connect via fiat gateway into the near ecosystem to purchase or stake near or other native tokens. It is difficult for the ecosystem project to get better financial exposure to the value they create in the form of financial products, liquidity of tokens, and institutional exposure. Largely, this is due to the fact that there are few custodian on-ramps that actually manage the user assets for them. Taken all together, these problems limit capital inflows to the ecosystem, as well as discovery of emerging near ecosystem projects. But let me offer a solution here. So the Spaceport docking station, a novel custodian on-ramp and on-web for the global market of retail users and institutional investors looking for exposure into the near ecosystem. Spaceport here operates as a middleway custodian offering newcomers to the near ecosystem the best of both worlds. Custody in security and tracking, uh, trading, staking, and interacting with the near dApps alongside, cost, alongside sorry, the, the unique um, capacity to undock or redock their assets into an account that, that only they can control with their private keys. So the platform is designed first and foremost to allow easy access into the world of dApps on near for non-crypto native individuals. Users can connect their bank account, credit or debit card, exchange their fiat into crypto, start actively trading or swapping across the suite of NEP 141 tokens featured on NIR, Aurora, and the Octopus networks. Beyond trading the NIR assets, Spaceport also provides staking infrastructure of NIR and Aurora tokens, sending and receiving on NIR and all other native tokens, as well as direct integrations with certain dApps such as games, metaverses, and NFT marketplaces. In this sense, Spaceport is a simple and easy to use on-ramp for users into the near ecosystem. In this manner, Spaceport is kind of like FTX is for the Solana network, so that native tokens can enjoy high levels of exposure to retail and institutional investors uh, market liquidity as well as on and off ramps into near for better capitals inflows into the ecosystems. Projects, meanwhile, can benefit from easier access to potential user base, better exposure to retail and institutionals alike, 
and more daily active users keen on testing the waters of crypto. With this background, I can now introduce the main feature, the market proposition of the Spaceport that makes it an ideal portal into the near ecosystem for users and institutions. Spaceport is designed to allow users undock their participation in the near ecosystem into their own near account and effectively deploy into the ecosystem with sole custody of their assets. The same concept applies for redocking of Spaceport and off-ramping defense. So suppose you have an account in the near ecosystem with um, locked tokens on a two-year vesting schedule. What this means to you? This means that you will receive full access to all the tokens on the, on the near account only in two years. But you want to sell those tokens now. Like, what will you do? This is where the spaceport comes into play. By having an opportunity to burn the existing private key and uh, to create the new one, user can transfer their near account to another user with any assets of locked and unlocked balance as a one single asset of value. All accounts in one marketplace. In this manner, Spaceport functions as a bridge par excellence for new users into the ecosystem. The user can create accounts on the Spaceport with a simple email and password. Trade, send, receive, stake, and participate with the ecosystem, and in this manner, familiarize themselves with crypto in a safe and risk-free way before easily deploying on their own whenever they are ready. The undocking of users into the near ecosystem ultimately offloads any interested user into crypto with full ownership of their finances, data, and the private keys. With this design, Spaceport is able to offer newcomers and institutions the best of both op opportunities, safe and secure access to near dApps, with an open door to go, to go in full crypto native at any point in the future. For near ecosystem projects, Spaceport brings active users, liquidity, and institutional exposure to native tokens actively used across near Aurora and Octopus. So with many analysts estimating that crypto adoption currently stands on the level 1998 of the internet, right? So the spaceport is positioned at the beginning of the crypto wave. For the near ecosystem, it is a clear first mover capable of dominating uh, the go-to market for retail and institutions alike. With near leading active developer accounts across L1 ecosystems, it is also fair to expect a suite of new services, tokens, dApps on near in the short future that will readily benefit from the spaceport. So the spaceport docking station is thus a game changer positioned to onboard the first billion users into crypto while always providing the opportunity to undock into the near ecosystem with full ownership of assets, data, and private keys. So come visit the Infor booth. We're all here. Ask us about projects. We are happily share. Uh, make sure that you visit the Pembroke Finance food truck with fine Ukrainian cuisine for you to try. Ask us, tell us, challenge us because the future is near and uh, we're building it together. And I thank you very much for your attention. Alina, thank you so much. That was Alina from Inc. Thank 4 you. and Spaceport. What an amazing talk. I truly believe that optional, custodi uh, optional custo custody <laughs> in cryptocurrency is going to be one of the greatest features that onboards more people from Web 2 into Web 3. So it's great to see projects like Spaceport around.
All right, uh, quick reminder that we have four different tracks here at NearCon that you can be following. Uh, we have ones for builders, for regulators, for creators, so on and so forth. Make sure to check those out at nearcon.org. Again, this is a silent disco event, so pick up a, a headset and put it on so that you don't have to worry about the background noise. Next, let me welcome up our wallet security workshop from Jeff Liu. He is from Sender Wallet. Jeff. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Uh, I'm Jeff and uh, Sander Wallet. Okay. So, so this, uh, this talk will be about uh, wallet and uh, wallet security. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Yes? Okay. So yeah, so let's uh, talk about it. So blockchain, okay, blockchain, digital ledger uh, technology or Web3, people have different ideas of what, what those are. So for me, uh, blockchain is like uh, this new revolutionary technology could potentially bring us like a tokenized world, ownership of digital asset, and potentially a brand new permissionless global financial system. Okay, the key word here is potentially, because we are not realizing that yet. There's a lot of uh, like uh, technical challenges need to be uh, somehow resolved before the potential can be realized. We have a lot of infrastructure problem. Uh, we, have, we have to figure out how to onboard the billions of Web2 users into the blockchain. All those things need to be figured out before we can, we can talk about support billions of users of Web3 uh, applications, okay? So uh, Bitcoin, Bitcoin started everything. We got, a, we got blockchain from Bitcoin, then we have uh, Ethereum, okay? So after that, right now, we have several major layer one blockchains competing to support Web3 applications, okay? Near protocol is one of them, okay? So near protocol, we say is simple, is secure, and scalable because the near protocol actually support the sharding technology, okay? So it's one of the major blockchains actually supporting sharding from the very beginning, okay? And if we talk a little bit about the technical side, is the sharding and the near support like execution and the data sharding. And it doesn't have a big chain like Ethereum, okay? So it's just chop a block into different chunks. Each shard will have this one chunk you put together become a block and they have this uh, VRF and to randomize to change the sharding so it, it cannot be attacked. A single shard cannot be easily attacked because it's changing all the time and randomly, okay? And the consensus use a BFT is slightly different with uh, Bitcoin and, and uh, Ethereum. So now we have a blockchain, but how the users use blockchain? How do they interact with the blockchain, okay? So the first thing most of the times you need is a wallet, is a crypto wallet to hold your chain, hold your coin, and to interact with the blockchain. You set a transaction onto the chain, and you do transfer, or you interact with some DeFi project, use some NFTs, it's, it's a, you, have, you need a wallet, okay? Since a wallet holding your coin, holding a lot of assets, so obviously it's a big target for attacks, for hackers to, to hack it. And we see this attack against wallet every day. It's a big target, okay? Uh, so it's a crucial part of uh, a blockchain security. We, we really need to make a wallet really secure. We don't want to lose our coin, okay? So who are we? Uh, Sander Labs, okay? The, our company, Sander, uh, was founded uh, like a year ago. And we have team members distributed all over the world, like Singapore, London, San Francisco, Malaysia, uh, and China, okay? And uh, our supporters and uh, investors, including Near Foundation, and quite a few well-known VCs in the industry. Uh, in fact, we have a uh, announcement today, actually. We, we have a new, new round of funding uh, led by Patera, and uh, the, the amount is 4.5 million. And uh, we have a participation with quite a few like uh, other uh, VCs. You can see the logos here, uh, including like uh, Crypto.com, John for Crypto, Amber Group, U Network, uh, and a bunch of others. Okay, so we're doing the announcement today. 
Uh, so uh, what do we do? So Sander, uh, we, we actually build wallet. So we, we have a wallet called the Sander wallet. I would say it's probably the only one in the near protocol. We have a full suite of product. We, we have a browser plugin. Uh, we have iOS and also Android apps. Okay, for the browser, we currently support uh, uh, Chrome, Edge, Brew, and Kiwi. Okay, so uh, and we, we of course have the iOS and the Android apps. So the majority, I would say, all the features actually supported right now is in the browser a plugin. Uh, the uh, the mobile version, so we're still moving the features to the mobile version, and so it's in the in the beta beta state right now. Altogether, we have uh, about half a million downloads right now. Majority of them in the in the browser, for us. Uh, and we collaborate with the major projects in the near ecosystem. Uh, we try to integrate all the services into the into the wallet, so user actually can go get the wallet and do everything. Not only transfer about the staking, a token swap, and NFT or others. Okay. And we also support the uh, fiat uh, unwrap, so you can use the uh, US dollars. Euros to buy uh, buy near or, or some other tokens USDC and uh, through this uh, MoonPay and Banka and uh, Transac. Okay, all those are integrated into the wallet. Uh, okay, so besides the basic transfer, uh, we have token swap. So you can swap tokens. It's like a DEX integrated into the wallet. Okay, so I actually have uh, multiple partners of the DEX. Uh, we we try to find the best price for you. So you just in the wallet, you just do, do the swap, okay? Uh, and staking. Okay, I think that the earlier uh, the panel pe people talking about staking, uh, we, we try to make it easy, okay? We, we don't want you go to, we don't need to go to different websites to find the different uh, like a staking service. You put it, your coin in. Uh, we put it in, in one place, okay? So we have a list of staking partners. You just pick the one, you, you, your favorite one, uh, and put your coin. You don't need to even leave the, the wallet, okay? And of course, the NFT. Okay, so you you want to see the NFTs? You want to see those photos, the pictures in, in your wallet? You can do it using uh, using Sander wallet. Uh, also, the uh, hardware hardware support, hardware wallet support. We just released uh, hardware hardware wallet is just another layer of security. It's a piece of hardware. You have to have it with you to do any transactions. So even somebody hacked your phone, hacked your computer, without this hardware wallet, they still cannot move the move the move the coin, okay? So the private key is, is in the hardware device. You never leave the device. You have to physically have that device to do any transactions. So that's a, just a, another layer of security for you. Okay? So we uh, currently support Ledger and Keystone, but uh, later we're gonna try to support all the major hardware wallet vendors. Okay? So let's talk about security, okay? Uh, as, as I said earlier, Crypto wallet is a large, large target for hacking that attacks because it holds so many uh, coins and potentially uh, the hacker will gain a lot of financial interest, right? So uh, this, uh, there's a, a concept called a private key. It's different with uh, like a Google account or Apple account. You have a user username and a password. You can change it. If you lose it, uh, Google or Apple can, can recover it for you. But here we're talking about private keys. This key cannot be changed. Uh, a lot of times you have to hold this key. You don't want anybody to see this key because whoever owns this key owns everything. Basically, there's a saying saying, not your key, not your coin. Right? You put it in some uh, centralized exchange. Uh, they, they actually own the, own the coin. They just, uh, you just put the, the trust to them uh, to, to take care of your coin. But if you use like a standard wallet, we call it a non-custodial wallet, meaning actually the key is within the phone or within the a laptop. So you own this key, and you do not want anybody to know this, okay? So it's not your key, not your coin. So never reveal your private key. And we have this uh, like a 12 words, secret word or mnemonic words uh, to help you to recover it. In case you lose the key, you kind of in enter all those words uh, and recover it. So you want to really safeguard those uh, 12 words also, okay? You don't want anybody to know, know this. So that's uh, the basic idea of a, uh, a wallet, a crypto wallet. It's, it's different with a Web2 uh, account. So how do they attack it? Okay, there's a lot of ways to attack a wallet. So most common ones is uh, somebody probably gonna do the phishing to send you a link. Okay, we have a new version of wallet. This is really nice. Just go here and download it. 
there's a lot of these emails going on every day. And somebody actually put some ads into, uh, into Google, uh, into maybe Bing, uh, saying, OK, uh, just click this link to download the Sander wallet or, or MetaMask wallet. So if you go there, they have a fake wallet, look exactly like a real one. But you download it, you enter your key, or you create a new wallet. Once you put your coin in, it, it will be gone. Okay. So, so be really careful. If you want to download from a link, you have to really make sure those link actually is authentic. Okay. Or you go to like an Apple account, or Android one, make sure this is, is real. Because I see a lot of things, people just download a, a fake app, a fake wallet. And a lot of things are done, millions of dollars got, uh, got stolen by that way. And uh, p people put on these ads, uh, sending out these links every day. Okay. So for example, if you want to download Sander Wallet, just go to sander.org or go to our Apple Store uh, or Android Store. Okay. Do not trust somebody randomly send you a link, uh, download this new version, this is really nice. Don't, don't do that. Okay, okay so how, how can we defend this? Okay, so uh, we, we do several things. Okay. So for example, our code, we have to do periodically security audit. And we have a bug bounty uh, program. And if anybody found anything, uh, we'd really like to know. And we're going to offer a reward. Okay? And we check the, the, the addresses. There's a lot of illegal, like malicious addresses. Uh, if you want to send to them, we have a database and update it dynamically. We want to make sure you don't send it to those like uh, scam artists or uh, stuff like that. Okay? And, and of course, we mentioned earlier, we support the hardware wallet, which is uh, probably safer than a software wallet alone. Okay? So if you have some uh, like a substantial coin, uh, I would uh, recommend you to use a hardware wallet uh, together with a software wallet. Okay? So this is just a point I mentioned. Uh, that's what, what we are doing. Uh, OK, so this is the same as the last slide, actually. So if you want to go into a little detail, a little technical, I think there's a bunch of things we are doing, OK? So today may, may, may not be a good time to, to talk about all, all through all, all of this. Uh, but uh, just understand there's uh, quite a few layers. It's common for the, uh, for the wallet. We have communication layer, React Active layer, like wallet native layer, and also data storage. All those layers are doing something. And there's some different attacks on, on these la layers. For example, in, in the top communication layers, we see a lot of uh, fake tokens. Actually, people just uh, put some uh, token, put them some smart contract in there, and they give a uh, same name, let's say USDC or near. You, you look, the na name is the same, but the contract address will be different. Okay, uh, there's a uh, near is probably doesn't doesn't see as much of these fake tokens on Ethereum. Ethereum have all kinds of things. Almost all the major tokens have a few copies which is fake. And uh, when you just look at uh, on the surface. They are just the same same token, but you be really really careful, okay? And the people actually try to manipulate a block information. They probably have a, a fake API just for you to connect to a fake chain. And if you go there, it, everything is just uh, manipulated by them. They can send you some tokens for you it looks real, but it, but it is fake. Okay, so those things uh, need to be careful also. And and we are doing we are doing some uh, like a defense against all this stuff. Like, like uh, at least uh, some like uh, attacks, like repeat unconfirmed taxes, and uh, also jailbreak. Okay, so people can do jailbreak of your phone. Okay, and uh, once they jailbreak, they probably can retrieve the private key in the phone. So, so you be really careful about this, and also that's why we also suggest if you have some like a a, a substantial amount of uh, tokens, might be a good idea to have a hardware wallet. Okay. Uh, but be careful of, of your phone. And the, once the phone is hijacked, they probably can retrieve the data storage. Although the private key actually is, is uh, encrypted, it's, it's not uh, straightforward to, to, to get your private key, even your jailbreak. But uh, there's some way to do that if, if, the, if the phone or laptop is hijacked. Okay? So that be, be careful. Uh, also, if you want to back up your data in the phone into, into cloud, into Apple or Android. So that be careful too, because sometimes those private key actually will be back up into the cloud too, which you may not want to do. Okay. So this, this is uh, another point that need to be, need to be careful. Okay. Uh, so for us, we are, we are doing something in the, in the background. The user probably doesn't need to know what we're doing, but we are doing all those things. Like uh, we check the API, the third party API. We don't want to just connect you to a, a fake blockchain. 
okay? And we audit all our code, uh, including the third-party API libraries we are using. We do periodic audit, make sure nothing uh, actually malicious in, in there, okay? Uh, and we check the we check the con address with, with the name, okay? And we also do community user com uh, educations to make sure people understand all these potential risks, okay? Conclusion, okay? Uh, conclusion is, uh, as we're mentioning, so uh, blockchain is uh, this uh, revolutionary technology, but uh, there's still a lot of issues that need to be fixed, okay? And the security of the blockchain and wallet is, is critical because this is, uh, this is the money we're talking about. The coin is, is money, okay? So, uh, and we see these attacks every day. There's a lot of attacks. I, I, I know a lot of people lost millions of dollars because uh, their wallet is attacked, okay? Uh, and also this uh, security is, is, a, is a system, it's, it's a holistic view. So we have to defend in the design, test, user education, and long-term monitoring protection, all, all these things need to do together, okay? To, to make sure we can uh, secure uh, the user's coin, and the user's digital asset. Okay, that's it, thank you. And if you like, I really want you guys to try our wallet. Thanks. Jeff, thank you so much. Wow, I'm a huge advocate for security, so seeing all of these different amazing ways that you can uh, make sure to secure your own wallet and things that developers need to be aware of when developing their wallets, that's just so cool to me and it's so great to see presented at a conference with so many attendees. We really need to get this information out there. So thank you so much, Jeff from Sender Wallet. All right, next up we have just a 30 minute break here. But before you go, uh, let me remind you that we have 18 projects in the Gamers Lounge that you can check out. We also have uh, various different regional foods uh, in the food trucks, so make sure to participate in our little food tour. And uh, Ilya, the founder of Near Protocol, is going to be talking to the JavaScript creator and the founder of the Brave browser, Brendan Ike, soon over on the Layer 1 stage. So be sure to check that out as well. All right, uh, now 30-minute break. this uh, afternoon, and I'm going to be welcoming up here Gile, who's going to be talking about developing on Near tools and docs you'll be happy to have. He's from DevRel on Pagoda. Everyone, give a big hand to Gile. Woo! Hi, everyone. Can you actually hear me? It's so interesting, this concept. I'm loving it. So, yeah, I'm Gile. I'm uh, one of the DevRel engineers at Pagoda, and today I'm going to be talking about developing on Near tools and docs you'll be happy to have. So, but first I would like to introduce myself. So, hi, I'm Gile. I'm originally from Argentina, for those of you who didn't know it. I'm actually, my background is in brain research. So I'm a neuroscientist, uh, but I have this passion to learn and teach. Uh, so I joined the community in 2020, right before the, the mainnet was released. And I found Nier and I love it because of the simplicity, because it was so simple to develop things on it. So I started building multiple projects and tools, and now recently, six months, six months ago, I actually joined to, in Pagoda as a DevRel engineer. So for those of you who doesn't know what is Pagoda, well, we are the people that is building the documentation of Nier, the tools, and everything that makes your life much, much easier as uh, someone that builds in Nier. If you want to actually come and talk with us, our booth is right in the entrance, it was on the left side before, but now we are right on the entrance. So please come to say hi. But today I'm not here to present Pagoda, but to talk about developing in Nier. Uh, particularly, how to get started in Nier, if any of you is, is interested in actually starting developing in Nier, which tools are there ready to be used, how our documentation can help you, and most importantly, how the community can actually help you to supercharge your application. So buckle up, because we have 10 minutes and a lot of ground to cover. So this is like the normal development cycle that you see in Web3, right? Like you will create the structure of your project, and then you will start like 
writing a contract, you will want to test it to make sure that everything is correct, please test your contracts. Then you will want to deploy it into the testnet the first time, then build the front end, and finally, once everything is out there, you want to monitor the app. You want to see what is happening, who is using it, and making sure that everything is correct. So let's start with seeing how you do this in Near, how you create first the structure of your project. Something that you can do to quick start your application is to actually use Create Near App. Create Near App is this awesome tool that is very simple to use. You just need to have Node.js in your computer, and then you just run npx create dash near not, uh, dash app at latest, and this application will appear that will ask you like, okay. So what language do you want to use for your smart contract? And you can choose. Uh, what your template, your front end, do you want it to be in Rust? Do you want it to be vanilla JavaScript? Or you don't want the front end? And then a name of your project. And Create Near App will readily give you this project with everything you need. You will have a Hello World smart contract, which is going to be in Rust or JavaScript. Then you're going to have, for that contract, unit and integration testing also in Rust or JavaScript, depending which one you prefer. And then a web, a web front end, which could be in React, vanilla JavaScript, or no front end if you decided to only create a, a smart contract. So once you have the structure there, you will most probably want to start writing your contract. To write your contract, you're going to be using our Near SDK. The Near SDK is a high-level SDK that comes in two flavors, the JavaScript TypeScript family and the Rust language. It is important to notice that everything you can do in Rust can also be done in JavaScript right now. So simply choose your favorite language and just start coding. And once you finish your smart contract, the uh, or SDK tools will allow you to compile that smart contract into WebAssembly. Now, oh. now after your smart contract is ready, you will want to test it. Please test your smart contracts. And in order to do that, besides of the unit testing, we have now this amazing tool called Workspaces that allow you to do integration testing. And it's very, very nice, because what it allows you to do is to take your smart contract and actually test it in a realistic environment. That can be either testnet or the sandbox. And let's use the sandbox as an example. What you can do is you can take your smart contract, which is already compiled as a WASM file, and deploy it into the sandbox. Then you're going to be creating accounts and make them interact with your smart contract. right? Like You're going to be calling methods, transferring, transferring money between uh, users, everything. And then the best part is that you can control the, the flow of time. So you can say, like, OK, I want this user to call this method, and now three epochs pass, and something else happens. And this, of course, like while you're doing that, you can go checking that the responses of your smart contract are the ones that you expect. Also, something else that you can do with workspaces is literally take another contract from the, te from the mainnet or testnet and say, like, can you actually grab that contract? Because I want to simulate interacting with it. So it's very, very useful, and I recommend you to use it. If you want to learn more about this, please go and check the talk uh, from Dennis, who is going to be on the third day of the conference in this same stage at 1.20. Now, once you've finished testing your contract, you will want to deploy it. For that, you can use the near command line interface. So the near command line interface basically is this very nice tool that allows you to deploy and interact with your contract directly from your terminal. And it's super simple to use. To deploy the contract, you just do near deep deploy and the wasm file that you want to deploy. And that will automatically create a dev account for you. And that's it. Like That account has your smart contract. And then if you want to interact with it, you will just be calling methods, like view or call. And then you will say the address of my smart contract, the method that I want to call, and the arguments. And that's it. Very simple. Once you finish with that, you will want to build a front end for the smart contract so other users can also use it. For that, you're going to be using near API.js and the wallet selector. The wallet selector is this one package that you add into your project and basically has this friendly graphical user interface that allows the user to select between multiple stances of wallets in Near. So you just add one package and 
readily you can go and your user can say like, ah, yeah, I want to use my near wallet or ledger or near wallet or whatever. And then you are also going to be using that with uh, near API JS because near API JS is going to allow you to directly talk with the RPC, with the network directly. So for many things, you're going to also use that. And finally, once your uh, smart contract and your D app is out in the wild, you will want to monitor it. For that, you have three options. And the first one is near index or for Explorer. That basically is a Postgres SQL database where you can query different things in the blockchain. Like for example, give me all the users that called this method in this smart contract in the past, and I want to see how much near they attach and if the transaction worked well or not, like if it failed or not. But then you also have near lake, which allows you to listen to events in real time. If you want to have an application that says like, hey, I want this application to be ping each time like an NFT gets minted, then near lake allows you to just hook to a web socket and get informed each time an event happened with your application or with any application in uh, the near network. And third, you have the Pagoda console, which is uh, this new product that we're releasing where you can do, for example, no code automatic alerts. So you can say, hey, please send me an email each time the balance of my contract is below something. Or send me an email if someone manages to withdraw money when they should not be withdrawing money. So it's very interesting. So please check it out. And also, you can do no code analytics. If you want to know more about the Pagoda console, actually, uh, Austin is going to be talking about it tomorrow at 12.40, so be sure to check it. Now, we cover a lot of ground, right? Like, we have create near app for when you want to create your project, you have the SDK for writing contracts, you have workspaces for testing, you have near CLI for deploying and interacting from the command line interface, you have near API JS and wallet selector for making the enough front end, and then you have in Indexer for Explorer, Near Lake, and the Pagoda console for monitoring the, the app, right? And that is a lot. So how can you keep track of all of this? And moreover, how can you know if someone, like how to use those, and if they get updated, how they get updated? And for that is that we have the or awesome documentation. In the past six months, we have been working a lot into refactoring, rewriting, and reorganizing our documentation. So please come and visit docs.near.org and you will find everything that you need about this. Particularly, the develop section is organized in the same way that I gave this talk. And that's for a reason. It's because generally you will want to quick start, then you will want to build, test, deploy and maintain, build the front end and then monitor. So just go to uh, docs.near.org and everything is there. Moreover, we have a huge selection of awesome examples and tutorials, which co go from basic cases of hello world and having an, uh, a counter and you know basic stuff, to zero to hero tutorials where you're going to learn everything that there needs to be learned about NFT. And finally, uh, or moreover, we also have an awesome community. For those of you who don't know Awesome Near, you have to go and visit it. AwesomeNear.com is amazing. Right now, they have a curated list of 792 projects and more to grow, where you're going to find wallets, explorers, exchange, and everything you need. So go visit it. Finally, we also have a Discord where we are more than happy to help you. So just come. We hold office hours every weekday. And if you don't find us there, just drop a question in the Dev Support channel. We're going to go through them. With that being said, in Pagoda, we have amazing tools, amazing docs, and an amazing community. Thank you so much for listening. Start coding in Near, and if you need any help, please come to our booth or to the hacker section. We're going to be here there to help you. Thank you so much. Wow, Gile, thank you so much. What an amazing talk. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much. I know if. When I had first started building on Nier, if I had listened to this talk, I could have got started so much faster. There are so many amazing tools that the DevRel team is creating and Gile specifically is working on. So thank you so, so much. Amazing, amazing. Perfect. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. <laughs>
All right, quick reminder before I welcome up our next uh, presentation. On the Nightshade stage at 3.15, just a quick reminder, we have a state of security panel with some smart contract auditors. So if you're interested in that sort of thing, be sure to check it out. But without further ado, let me welcome up our next presenters. Um, talking about the complete suite for next gen near building, Eugene. Hi guys, do you hear me? Yes? Very good. While we're still getting some things figured out, be sure to, when uh, af after this presentation, be sure to check out the whole rest of the conference. We have a bunch of presenters over this way, so you can, you can go check out some booths. Uh, we also have a whole bunch of different food trucks with food from a lot of different regions of the world, so you can go on a mini food tour all within the warehouse. Uh, we also have some outdoor seating. There's a DJ and some stuff uh, over here. Um, let's see. And I'm not a stand-up comedian, but I found some cryptocurrency jokes. What's the difference between SpaceX and Near? SpaceX will actually return to the Earth after takeoff. How we doing? You know, when it comes to technical issues, cryptocurrency companies are really good at hashing those out. Just gonna sit here and laugh at my own jokes. Uh, no, I, I will try. I will try to use the PDF uh, because I say I, I do play from start and it looks okay. Now it's now it's not showing anything. Uh, so. Whitecoin also has an airdrop. Uh, you want to make sure to check out their booth. They're giving away t-shirts and they're doing an airdrop because they have their token generation event is going on soon. Is that... Start, I think. 
Uh, am I am I am I online? Hi, hi guys. Hi guys. Take it uh, away. Very good. Uh, we figured out uh, some Web two issues uh, with uh, displays and stuff, so we can start uh, talking about building uh, on near on on Web three technologies. I will piggyback a little bit on the Pagoda talk uh, because after you use Pagoda, you need to start using Chainstack. I will explain why. Um, so the guys are building the set of tools that you need to uh, use to start building on near, but then you start running some stuff in production, right? So now you need like some high RPS uh, kind of services that allow you to scale and then you can run basically like for millions of users. So that's uh, what Chainstack is doing. So we're basically uh, the most powerful suite of services connecting uh, people and applications to decentralized infrastructure, right? Uh, so we're enabling a lot of different uh, applications in different segments and verticals uh, from DeFi to analytics and everything in between, like including NFT marketplaces, you name it, like uh, uh, DApp marketplaces and so on, like payment systems, oracles, DEXs, uh, and everything in between, right? So basically all the large-scale applications, they need some sort of infrastructure with support, reliability, uh, and, uh, and services that allow you to scale and sleep well at night to have peace of mind after you build your app and after you deployed it. So uh, TLDR of this talk is that uh, Chainstack likes Near and we uh, love the community and uh, its, its vibrancy. Um, so we love uh, uh, Near builders as well. So uh, that's why we are here. Uh, now it's not moving anymore. Okay. Now it's lagging one slide. It's interesting. Uh, so, uh, what Chainstack does is that we provide uh, uh, reliable and fast near infrastructure. Um, who needs this? I already explained. Like anybody who would build any application on near, in the end, if you run in production, then you need a service like like Chainstack. So basically, we make sure you have uh, uh, fast, reliable, scalable access to uh, to the blockchain infrastructure, so that you can read data from the blockchain and you can write data to the blockchain too. Right, so basically we take all the burden uh, from you of you managing nodes. Uh, if you start using like public RPC endpoints and you get like rate limited or throttled, that's something that you would need to consider using after you, if you move to production. So that's basically uh, uh, the service that we provide for both near mainnet, near testnet, and more to come. I will talk a little bit uh, later about other things that we are launching today. Uh, while the next slide is coming, uh, we have different options uh, for the service. Uh, basically, you can use us as, a, as an elastic infrastructure. So basically, you plug in our endpoints to your DAP um, like this. And uh, then it just runs. And you don't think about, like uh, again, rate limiting, throttling. The disadvantage of this model for uh, builders who are running some really large scale applications that they uh, have to pay per, per RPC call or like per API call, uh, it's the same as other node providers in the world provide their services, right? So basically, you plug in the endpoint. Uh, it's geographically distributed. You have access to different like um, uh, nodes and different um, data centers, in our case, in different regions, in different cloud providers. Uh, so what we also do, uh, we provide dedicated nodes, uh, which gives you unlimited access to, uh, to near infrastructure. So let's say we have customers who are running like 10,000 RPS on, uh, on their decks, right? So it's a lot of volume, so if you pay per uh, calls, uh, your bill will be very huge. So what we do as, a, uh, as an alternative business model to the um, uh, traditional like, Elastic model, we provide dedicated API nodes uh, to access the, um, uh, the bl blockchain data and to send transactions. So there are basically no limit on the request that you send to, to your nodes. Uh, you can spin up nodes very quickly. They are completely synced. You can do it in multiple data centers. So let's say you understand that your uh, customer base is primarily in Portugal. So you can run a node somewhere close to uh, Portugal. For instance, we provide data centers in Frankfurt and Amsterdam. Or you, you think that your major uh, like user base is in, in US. Or you're a trader and you want to trade something uh, like somewhere from very low latency. So for instance, you're based in Singapore. So you can have a near node in Singapore. And you have like absolutely minimal latency to, uh, to your near node in Singapore. Um, so there's a technology that is providing all these all these batteries for our um, uh, for our services that we provide is called Bolt. Uh, so without Bolt, you are really struggling to sync any blockchain node because uh, as blockchain is designed, 
it's very distributed and it contains all the data from all the history of all the transactions that happen in the chain. So we develop a technology that allows you to spin up a new uh, dedicated node on all blockchains, including NIR, uh, and it can be up and running in, in a few minutes' time, and it's completely synced, and you can do it in any data center. So it's pretty cool technology. Uh, we use it across all our um, 18 protocols that we support today, and this obviously applies to NIR too. Uh, so it's very cool. Uh, we recommend you just to feel it and like register on the platform and try to run your own dedicated node. It will be just spinned up in like five minutes. It will be completely synced, and it will be complete your own node. Uh, today, we are very excited to launch our Aurora support because without Aurora, uh, there's no NIR. Without NIR, there's no Aurora, so they are all coming together today. And we're launching a managed service for Aurora today. Uh, I will do a very, very little demo, how platform looks like. Uh, I like doing like demos. So uh, I will show you how to spin up your uh, personal, private Aurora node in no time. And you, get, you can basically leverage all that that I mentioned for NIR just for Aurora. So let's try. Seems to be working so far. Uh, so here's Chainstack. Um, so basically, when you uh, join Chainstack, you have a bunch of uh, projects that you can create. Uh, you can uh, like select type of project that you want to do. Um, we support like public networks, private networks, uh, whenever you want to build. Uh, so let's say I have a project with my uh, public networks. Uh, that I created um, for a long time. Here's a collection, as you see. We have many blockchains uh, supported. Uh, sometimes I have like uh, six nodes running, 12 nodes running uh, for a given network. So let's say I have a near um, network here and I have a couple of nodes. So we support all the modes for all the nodes, like full, archive, basically whatever you want. Um, when you have a node, you can uh, get inside, have some basic uh, information about the node. Here, as you see, I just launched it today and I created exactly one uh, request. Here you can see it on the dashboard. Um, you can uh, get all the access points uh, to, your, uh, to your node and plug it in into, uh, like, in, in case of Aurora, you can plug it to MetaMask. In case of Near, you can plug it into your app or new wallets that will be appearing on a Near ecosystem. Um, for the sake of the demo, I will show you some node that has been running for a while just to see how the dashboard looks like. Uh, let's take some uh, Ethereum mainnet node. Uh, let's say the first one. Uh, so you see that it's processed a bunch of requests, so uh, almost 2 million requests. Um, here's a chart. You can swap between like uh, 7 days, 24 hours. You can see the breakdown uh, for calls that you've sent to your node, like the response codes, like whether they were successful or not. And again, get all the connection details to your node. So I will show you how easy it is to spin up uh, your own node on Chainstack. Um, so let's say we want to demo uh, Aurora today because we just launched it. Um, let's use mainnet, for instance. You can read more stuff uh, about all the blockchain networks that we support and understand like what's the difference between full archive, what kind of node do you need. So we have amazing documentation for everything that we uh, built. You can choose like dedicated archive nodes. Um, you can also host your own node in your own infrastructure if you want. So some particular customers they want to run. Uh, nodes closer to, to their own application so that they have minimal latency. So uh, we enable all that too. Uh, so far we launched Aurora in Amsterdam. Um, and uh, let's say I name my node NearCon, uh, NearCon 2022. Uh, so it shows me what it will be like, how much would it cost, and so on and so forth when it will be deployed. And then I just uh, join the network. In a couple of minutes, uh, it will be launched. The internet is pretty slow here, but uh, I have one node running from, uh, uh, from today morning. Uh, so while it's spinning up, um, just want to show you some documentation. So we have uh, very extensive documentation for each protocol we support, including Aurora, for instance. We have all the interaction tools here described, like, OK, how to plug in your node into MetaMask, uh, what kind of development tools you can use. By the way, we need to add Pagoda here, apparently. Uh, so we'll work on it after the stock. Uh, we have all the traditional like EVM tools like Truffle, Hardhat, and anything that you've worked before when using like Ethereum and other EVM networks um, like Web3.js. We even support Web3.php. Anybody use Web3.php? It's actually a pretty widely used framework. I, I was, I was kind of amazed. But uh, so Web3.py, of course, like Web3.php too. People are using PHP today. Um, Ethers.js and all that. So you can find all these um, tools here. We also write amazing uh, tutorials. 
So let's say for Nier, we wrote a tutorial um, uh, how to do a message contract. It's like step by step, so you can go uh, one after another and uh, just go through the tutorial to get understanding on how to build things on a given uh, blockchain. We have it for all protocols that we support, so as you see, we support quite a lot. Um, uh, so we have amazing uh, documentation built for all of that. Let's see whether my node is up and running or not. Not yet. Um, so the original one will look exactly the same. So the beauty of Chainstack is that you have uh, all the same experience for all the blockchains that you support. So uh, if you start using it for, let's say, Ethereum, and then you want to move to Near, even though it's not EVM-based network, you will see exactly the same sort of experience, UI, UX. So you don't need to learn new, new tools. You don't need to learn new platforms, how to access uh, the new network that you, you, you want to start building on. So it's uh, all heterogeneous experience for our, all the networks that we support. Um, so, okay, this is, uh, this is uh, the old one. Let's see. The internet is pretty slow. Okay, it's not loading now. So okay, uh, maybe I should connect my phone. Let's try. Oh, maybe mute up. Okay, so the uh, NIRCON node is up and running. We can access it and see the, the node details. As you see for other, other uh, nodes that I show, like NIR nodes or Ethereum nodes. Uh, so you can see all the namespaces supported by the node, the version, uh, and of course the same dashboard with requests and response codes for, uh, for the node in the same way as you would see for any other, any other blockchain node. Um, so to learn more, uh, I recommend you to uh, go to our uh, website. So basically we have a uh, detailed expl explanation of our offering for Near and Aurora on our website. So if you go to chainstack.com and choose Near Aurora from the top menu, you will see uh, the description of what it can do, what it cannot do. You can see amazing documentation on the docs website. You can go through tutorials. Uh, we're also hiring. Uh, our team is around 90 people uh, around the world. So we have 20 plus countries in the company. So we are very remote. Uh, we have people everywhere because we are infrastructure company, so we need to operate 24/7. Uh, so we have people on all continents. So if you're if you're interested in blockchain infrastructure, feel free to join us. Uh, very cool times, uh, very exciting. So welcome to Chainstack near Aurora. We're very happy to be here. Um, if you have any questions, guys, we apparently have some time for questions. There seems to be a microphone that you can walk and ask questions if you want. Can you hear me? Can you try one more time? Hello, can you hear me? Kinda. Kinda. Remotely, remotely, very remotely. Is it better now? Nope. But you can try. I, I could understand that you're saying. Okay, I'll try to talk louder. So, does Chainstack support uh, custom DNS, like custom domain for, uh, for a node? That's a great question. So um, the main names is part of our roadmap for this year because we want to provide a complete set of services that any builder would need. So uh, APIs for blockchain is one. Uh, what, is, what else is our own? Our roadmap is storage, obviously. So like access to IPFS, Rweave is on our, is on our roadmap. So what, that's what, something that we're working on right now. All sorts of indexing solutions like the graph, for instance, we're going to support our own uh, hosted service for the graph. Um, and then DNS is the next, basically. So we want to support all the um, domain name systems on all the corresponding network through the like unified API, so that whenever, let's say, you need to register a domain or resolve a domain or get information about the domain, you will have a unified API that will allow you to do that. So this is on our roadmap uh, for this year. Okay, thanks a lot. All right, guys, thank you very much. All builders unite. Uh, have a great time and start using Chainstack today. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much, Eugene.
Yeah, I'm really excited about Chainstack because this sort of dynamic infrastructure where you can just spin up a node right from, uh, right from your own home computer is exactly what we need to grow the decentralization of the network and expand it to be supported all over the world. This is how we grow near. All right, before I introduce our next presenter, let me just remind you that at the layer one stage, there is a, a panel called Why We're Building on Near. It's at 3.40 p.m., and there are some pretty big network players that are gonna be talking there from Aurora and Mintbase and Orderly and more. But now, let me welcome up our next presenter from AHA Labs, talking about making it rain, launching smart contracts on Near. Chad Ostrowski. In just a minute. <laughs> oh no, I need to find more jokes. <laughs> Those were the only two I had. Well, don't forget we have the uh, ecosystem uh, expo over here with, uh, I think, 30 plus different uh, presenters that you can go check out their booths. There's, uh, let's see, USDC, Sweatcoin. We also have tons of food, tons of drinks. Check it out. There's the Aurora booth over here as well. Go talk to some people. Make connections. There are over 2,000 people here. So talk to the person next to you. See what they're working on. Um, there's also the hackathon, so you can go and write some code, talk about our new JavaScript SDK. We got a lot of people just swarming around ready to, ready to help you. Are we ready? All right, let's talk about making it rain. Thank All you, Chad. Right. There we go. All hear me? Okay. We're gonna try to do the same thing the last guy tried to do and hope that it works better this time. Let's find out. So I'm plugged in there. Open displays. It's not even showing up. Do you want to try your the other dongle, the other adapter? Thanks. Is my mic still on? Can they still hear me? Doesn't look like it. Hey, all right. Main display. This should be your main display, right? The built-in retina. Yeah. Stop mirroring. Okay. You want the other one? It's the display. Okay. Try your face. Cool. All right, and I drag it off to the right. Let's move it to the left. No internet, right, I never connected. All right, it's gonna work. All right, and I should be able to drag it. Do you all see it? I can't.
good. All right. Well, see that? Rain is coming. Woo! Can you hear me? All right. How many people have their headphones on? I see some people without headphones on. It's time to tap them and say, hey, put your headphones on. You in the second row there. Headphone time. We finally got it. <laughs> All right. Testing, testing. One, two, three. Make it rain. Rain is coming. There we go. Uh, so the slides are at rain.dev slash talks slash nearcon. You can follow along. There are links in there and everything. Also, if you want to watch it, it's already pre-recorded. So you can just watch it. We could watch it right now together, and I could just stand here in front of you and nod along. All right, I am Chad O on Twitter and GitHub as Chad OH, Chad O. Willem here and I co-founded AHA Labs together last year, or beginning of this year, after parting ways with Near Inc., now Pagoda. You can go to their stand and ask why we parted ways. Uh, we've now merged with pixel8.io. Jonathan is here somewhere. I'm not sure where Jonathan is. Jonathan, he's in the back corner. Hello, Jonathan. All right, so Jonathan is the founder, one of the founders of Pixel 8. Um, and together we are all working on Rain. You can find Rain at rain.dev. It's near backwards, by the way. So R A E N dot dev. And you can follow us on Twitter and GitHub at raindev, one word. Today we're going to talk about two problems, a big problem and a small problem. The big problem is ecosystem-wide, blockchain ecosystem-wide, DAP, Web3, OpenWeb, DWeb ecosystem-wide, and that problem is this. No one knows how to build DAPs. Okay, that's not strictly true. Some people have figured out some useful patterns, but good luck figuring out those patterns if you're new. Most people don't know. Most documentation doesn't go that far. Most tooling isn't that expansive. The smaller problem is with near smart contracts. They're black boxes. They don't play nicely with others. Only the author of a smart contract can really dig in and figure out how to interact with that contract. Everyone else needs to search for the source code or deconstruct web app workflows or give up. And now I assert that solving the small problem is the key to fixing the big problem. And if that's true, that's great because we already solved the small problem. The solution is RAIN. To understand how RAIN works, let's see how other people solve this problem. Ethereum solved it with an ABI system. ABIs are JSON files generated from your smart contract that contract authors distribute off-chain using GitHub or some other system. Pagoda, FKA Near Inc., are copying this system. We're not totally sure how their ABI system is going to work yet, but as far as we know, it's going to be similar to this. WebAssembly, aka WASM, Near's runtime VM, are solving this problem with WIT, WebAssembly interface types. More compact and readable than the JSON of ABIs, WIT fits easily into a custom section of a deployed smart contract. So that's exactly what Rain does. Rain inspects your Rust contract. Someday all other languages will be supported. It is working off of a WebAssembly standard. And it generates the WIT. It compiles your smart contract, injects the WIT, compresses the whole thing, making the end result smaller than if you built without Rain. And then you can go deploy it on chain so that the wit is right on chain accessible to anyone who knows your contract name. This leapfrogs the ABI system. Now, like I said, anyone who knows a contract's name can generate any tooling for that contract. Now that the wit is there, we can build tools that consume the wit, consume the schema, and we can generate an ABI so we can be compatible with whatever Pagoda is working on. We can generate TypeScript for your front end. We can generate a CLI. We can generate an admin panel web app. This one already exists. 
It's called Rain Admin. You can Rain build your contracts and teach with this, collaborate with this, build with this today. We're going to do a little bit of a, I, I wanted to do a live work walkthrough, uh, but I am not on my laptop because my laptop would not work with this system. But I do have a video if you could bring up that thing. So if you go to rain.dev slash admin, that'll give you a link to the Rain guide, which is our little friendly way to learn Rust and Near together. Let's see if I can get this video up. It's been a long time since I've used Windows. Will this open? Cool, can you hear it? No? How do we make sure the audio from the computer goes through? Look at that, I can nod along. All right, eh? can you hear it now? No, you still hear me. Well, let's rewind a little. Which version of me do you hear? This one or that one? All right, tell me, tell me whenever, all right, thank you for the fingers, that's very helpful. Which one of me do you hear? All right, I guess you still hear me. Well, I could talk through. I can like say what I'm saying in the video. How about that? Let's do that. We don't need, we don't need the audio from the video. All right, so we're gonna go to rain.dev slash guide. You can follow along on your laptops. Uh, there's a 30 minute video going through this guide if you wanna go through that. Otherwise, you can go to the getting set up section. We're just not gonna bother with that. Uh, if you need help installing Rust or Wasm or Rain, or configuring your editor, we've got you. It has you clone this Rain Dev Examples repository into a local Rain Examples folder. Uh, you need to build with Rust before your editor can show you the help documentation for Rust. So that's what's gonna happen there. Now we're gonna go see the code. You have to open Rain Examples slash contract slash counter for all of the help stuff in Rust to work. Otherwise, someday it'll work from the root rain examples repository, but not quite yet. In Rust, you've got a cargo toml that you'll see the dependencies. We depend on near SDK there. And then we're going to go into librs, and you can see our imports at the top. We're importing borscht. Who knows what borscht is? One person knows what borscht. Two people maybe know what borscht. Three. All right, Borsch, your contract needs to be stored as bytes on disk between calls to the blockchain. Borsch is the serialization format that the Rust core team, the near core team created in order to do that. So this is the, the main part of the contract. It's got a get num function. You can see a comment above it with the three slashes. That's a documentation comment. Public method returns the counter value. We'll see all of that again soon. So usually you only see that when you're building the contract. But if you build with rain, you can see rain build dash dash release. This is a little bit of a wrapper around cargo build dash dash release. It's also adding other nice flags that you always need when you're building on near, like compile to wasm, stuff like that. And now we can near dev deploy and you could copy in this counter target res counter dot wasm. Or you can, if you're using ZSH or bash, you can do a subcommand using dollar parentheses. So you'll see me put back in rain build dash dash release and add the dash Q flag so that it's quiet and it only says that output. So this, someday rain will wrap near CLI and you'll only, you could call rain dev deploy and it'll just work. But for now, if you want a one liner, it'll do that. Okay, so if you've never used near dev deploy, it creates a new account for you, dev dash whatever dash whatever. You can copy that. This is a brand new testnet account, never existed before. That was just created for us, and the contract was deployed to it. And you can see when we go to rain.dev slash admin, this is just a tool, like a tool you could build 
a tool that could run on the CLI and it already has all of the methods from the contract, all the comments from the methods, those are all included. If you're used to Ethereum ABIs, they don't come with all of the comments. So this is a huge power up from what's available on Ethereum. We're gonna sign in using Near Wallet, chad.testnet. So this is, this is a little web app built in React. It's using Near API JS to sign us in. We can just hit submit. You'll see the little loading thing down at the bottom. Jonathan's got a great in progress thing to improve how this result looks. All right, so now we're gonna add a new method. Instead of just increment and decrement, we're gonna add set num so that we can just set it to anything. Um, if you've never seen Rust before and you're confused by the i8 thing, that's an eight bit integer. It can go from negative 128 to positive 127. An eight bit signed integer. All right, oh, I guess I was showing decrement first. Increment, decrement. Right now, that's all this method, this contract comes with. So now we're gonna add set num, just copy increment. Go me from Saturday, do it. All right, set num. This one's gonna have an argument. This mute self is a mutable reference to the data of the smart contract. That's what all of these methods are doing. You can see the view method up on line 17 ha doesn't have that. So every method in Rust needs that. And now this is actually a new argument that I'm adding, like an argument instead of the implicit self, if you will. So nothing here should be surprising. We set self.val to the new val. We log that we set it to the new val and we return it. By the way, you can do explicit returns in Rust. No one does that. So if you see just a self.val on the last line, that is returning self.val, which matches the little arrow i8 on the side there. Those have to be matching data types. So now we rerun that one-liner. Oh, you can also see the, uh, when you do near dev deploy, it creates the near dev folder up on the left. And the next time you run it, it just uses the same account. So we're, we redeploy to the same account. So all we have to do is refresh the page and set num shows up there on the side. Now we can set it. We can try to set it to an, a value that's out of range. Rain admin sees that that's not allowed and says, no, it needs to be below 127. We set it to 127 and it works. Great. And then, a fun thing, you can go increment it again, and it'll go from 127 to negative 128, because it's only an 8-bit integer, so it overflows back to the bottom value. Uh, if you go through the guide, you can learn more about that and an easy way that Rust gives you to fix that. I think, yeah, we're gonna stop watching the video now. Cool. Well, that worked out okay. Uh, how do I close a video though on Windows? I don't know. We'll just go back here. Okay, so to recap, a fully maximi maximized version of Rain, like if everyone on Nier were using Rain, the Nier would be a smart contract platform that any, a, a development platform that any engineer could build on, where any engineer could build on anyone else's smart contract, anyone else's code with confidence, with all of the types, all of the documentation available for any contract that's deployed. Which brings us back to the big problem, no one knows how to build dApps. And what this really means is that we're all still figuring it out together. New ideas are gaining prominence, new visions gaining salience amongst people building dApps. One vision for the open web for dApps is thin apps that read, write, and interact with open data, right? With data from many different sources, many different smart contracts. Some that the app developers wrote themselves, some that pre-existed public infrastructure. 
And if that's your vision, then what a boon is a fully typed smart contract ecosystem. We're going long on this vision. Rain, born a build tool, will evolve into a framework, helping developers build ambitious apps, helping them compose secure, well-architected smart contracts, yes, and more than that, because ambitious apps need more than just smart contracts, they need front ends, they need indexing layers, they need off-chain storage. Rain will pull all of these together and make it easy for developers to build full, uh, my notes really would have been helpful at this part. Uh, they'll allow developers to build ambitious apps using all of these patterns and take advantage of new, uh, new DAP patterns as they emerge, right? As, as new ideas of how to build decentralized apps gain traction, Rain can evolve and kind of with, their new, with new releases help developers take advantage of all of that. Let's see an example of how this might work in practice. We'll follow three developers, Ali, Bob, and Cal. Windows emojis, everyone. I've never seen them before. These are fascinating. All right. Ali is a smart contract author building new DeFi offerings who just joined Near from some other smart contract platform. In her command line, she types rain generate contract AMM and gets a new automated market maker contract. She types rain generate contract FT and gets a new fungible token contract. And she starts hooking them together. She doesn't, she's, she feels immediately productive in her new smart contract ecosystem with her new programming language. Bob is a business founder, founder front end dev remixing data from three existing smart contracts. In his command line, he types rain new project dash dash use, followed by the names of those three smart contracts. And he gets a new project with a, configured with a fully typed front end and some subgraph code to index those contracts and some tests to show him how he's done. He's already busy building business logic, doesn't need to bother with any boilerplate or reverse engineering. Cal is new to Web3, migrating from Web2. In their command line, they type rain new project and get a tutorial app. Front end, subgraphs, tests, contracts, off-chain storage perhaps, all hooked together already. They go through the tutorial, launch their hackathon project, they can scale their hackathon project after the hackathon's over, keep working with their team and grow it easily into something that's a well-architected code base that can actually serve real customers. That's where we want to get to. We think it'll take about six months. We've got, uh, uh, we're growing our team, more than doubling our team from what it was in the first half of the year, which is what it took to build Rain as it is today. To help us, go ahead and start using Rain, first of all. It makes your life easier. It's an easy thing to do. You saw how easy it was in that video. All you need to do is install Rain, and when you build your contracts, use Rain Build. Uh, you can follow us, Rain Dev, Chato, Willem Neal, Jonathan. If you have a Twitter handle, I'll add it later. Star, fork, follow, contribute. GitHub.com slash Rain Dev is where all of our code is. We're working out in the open. Uh, you can fund us if you want. You can send donations to our DAO, which we just set up. And if you're connected to some other funding source, if you work with another project that intersects with some of what we're doing, we are interested in growing this framework in a way that is going to work for you too. So let us know if there's something that we can research and funding opportunities there. And finally, you can join our Discord. Again, the slides live at rain.dev slash talks. And if you want to get fancy, you can add the slash nearcon. These are all links, so you can just click on these instead of needing to screenshot them or whatever. Um, that's it. I think I am a minute over time, so no questions. But catch me in the hallway. Thanks for listening. I would love to talk about Web3 architectures and hear about what you're building. See you out there. Awesome, thank you so much, Chad.
Yeah, rain is amazing. It's the build tool we've all been waiting for so that we can quickly get up and running with our new and latest and greatest Web3 projects. All right, so our next presenters that we have today are from Circle, Circle Internet Financial. Uh, we have Khalid talking about understanding USDC for devs. And Long, Long Wing. Yes? All right, Long, all right, from Circle. Awesome, thank you so much. If you can hear me, please give me a thumbs up. Perfect. OK, if you'd like to follow along on this slide, please scan the QR code below or to the right side. You're looking at a payment taking place here. Notice that there's something that's being transferred called USDC. There's 5.65 of it. And this is actually taking place at a coffee shop in the Bay Area in California. Sorry, give me a second. OK, sorry. OK. OK, OK, OK. As I was saying, this is a payment taking place at a coffee shop in the Bay Area in California. And this coffee shop is leveraging the power of crypto technology for seamless business transactions with no middleman. It's settling straight through the Solana blockchain. Now, can you just imagine 10 years from now, even five years from now, large companies and potentially even supermarkets using Web3 technology to settle all of their business transactions with each other and with their, their customers. That frankly sounds like a very, very exciting future. And it is already here with much more to come. Hi, I'm Long coming to you from Circle Internet Financial in Boston, where I am a software engineer level two working on the stablecoin engineering team where I've helped to launch USDC on two of our eight blockchains that we support. And today, I just showed you a glimpse into the future, and I want to talk about what's behind that. I want to give you some context behind one of our core strategies as a company at Circle, which is USDC itself, the coin that you saw being transacted previously on the first slide. Let's begin. I first want to talk to you about what USDC is and why it matters. So for this first portion of the talk, I really want you to think about the utility of such a coin. To start with, USDC represents a new approach to how we think about global commerce and finance. Right? So it moves globally at the speed of the internet. That is, it's an internet-based value transfer that can essentially take the place of traditional payment rails. And by traditional payment rails, I mean things such as cross-bank wire transfers, ACH, SEPA. These are all mechanisms that you might be familiar with, right? You have SEPA here in Europe, ACH is supported in the US. And the thing with these traditional payment rails is that they take anywhere from one to five days, which, you know, frankly speaking, we're all here as crypto developers, is very, very slow. Now, USCC is a borderless digital dollar, which means it transcends that kind of notion, right? So as an example, in the US, we have something called Venmo, which allows users to send each other money for goods that they might have bought for each other. The problem is you can't Venmo somebody who doesn't live in the US. So a lot of my Canadian friends, they've heard of this Venmo thing. They're like, I don't know what it is. Everybody talks about it, but I have no idea how to use it, and I don't think I can. So conversely here, we transcend all kind of notions about traditional geographic borders, right? So whether it's from Canada to Portugal, US to Canada, it doesn't matter. USDC itself is a borderless digital dollar. The beautiful thing about it is that, you know, as you know, on blockchains, transactions can hit finality that is actually be confirmed for real within a matter of seconds, really, depending on the blockchain that you're looking at. So seriously, again, think about the utility of a transaction that can be completed across different nations in just a few seconds. That is very, very powerful. This is really a new approach of using and leveraging the infrastructure of the internet to empower economic prosperity for all. 
We are stable, programmable liquidity. And by that, I mean that we're fully reserved. So for every US dollar coin that sits on the internet on any of the blockchains that you interact with, there is a real physical fiat US dollar somewhere in real life, probably in a reserve account at a bank. So USDC is backed by cash and short dated US financial instruments, which means you can always redeem one to one. You can always on, on ramp and off ramp. On top of that, we have quite a few factors here for trust. Every single month we publish attestations that reflect our finances. And on top of those monthly attestations, we have weekly reports that allow you to stay updated on the composition of our reserves. That is exactly how much cash we're holding, how much US government bonds are in our possession that composes USDC, so on and so forth. And we're actually custodied and managed by leading US financial institutions. So far, I've given you some basic information to help you build trust, right? And to establish credibility for one of our core strategies here at Circle. If you want real concrete numbers, here they are. As of September 2022, this month, there are over 51 billion US dollars in circulation in the form of USDC. That's a very, very large number. Over the last two years, since July 2020, we've grown more than 5,000%. Okay, I said 5,000. That's a 50x increase. 50x. It's not an insignificant amount. Just imagine the possibilities when, like I said, 10 years from now, almost every business you interact with on the street takes USDC or some other stable coin that's just like it, trusted and valuable and speedy. Right now we have 190 countries that are actively transacting in USDC. Imagine when that number is the number of countries in the entire world. The future is really very exciting. Again, these are numbers on this chart. So here's an actual graph showing our growth from January of 2020. As you're looking at this, I want to walk you through some milestones. The first was the inception of USDC. In 2018, the Center Consortium, which at this point consists of Circle and Coinbase, launched an effort to represent the US dollar in the form of a stable coin. So this led to an initial upgraded spec of VRC20 on Ethereum, as you may know, for the US dollar coin. We announced USDC in May 2018, and it was officially launched in September of the same year. So, you know, moving on to the second stage of USDC's life cycle, which is initial adoption, we started off very humbly you know, we were basically always below 1 billion in market cap until the summer of 2020. So if you look at this first circle here, circle, in July of 2020, USDC finally hits a billion dollars. What an exciting milestone, right? And less than a year later, just less than a year later, in December, Visa announces that they're gonna try out transaction settlement in USDC. What that means is that merchants and vendors can get their customers' money straight to USDC, right, with no middleman. That's very exciting. That was our first big milestone with a financial leader. And again, less than a year later, that same year, or a, less than a year later in July of 2021, MasterCard announces that they also are launching a pilot program to test out transaction settlement in USDC. So all in all, if you notice, from July 2020 to July 2021, in just one short year, three of these milestones were hit. That brings us to the last milestone for us now, which is the current timeline. As you've noticed, now, about a year later, as of September 2022, the USDC is the fourth largest cryptocurrency by market cap. So if you don't believe me, you can go on your phone right now, go to coinmarketcap.com, you'll see us as number four. And as some of you may have experienced over the last few months, there's been a lot of market volatility in crypto. And yet, we're still stable even in the face of all of that. There's really just that one little slide down and the market cap comes right back up. Now, I've given you the basics behind USDC. I've given you some really, really interesting stats to showcase our growth. And now at this point, you might be wondering, 
how does it actually work? How do you go from real physical USD to actual USDC that lives on a blockchain? There are four crucial steps here to think about. The first is the transfer of physical fiat, real USD. The second is the moving of this fiat to some reserve account in a real bank. The third is the creation of the corresponding amount of USDC in the form, USD in the form of US dollar coin. And finally, the fourth step is crediting the customers and businesses that we interact with. So to give you some more information here, that first arrow, the green one, it represents the on-ramp. So what that is, is you go through the traditional payment rails such as credit cards, debit cards, ACH, SEPA, wire transfers, and you deposit your fiat with us here at Circle using our products. Once that money's there, as I mentioned in step two, we transfer that money to our reserve accounts, and then the rest is pretty straightforward. We mint or distribute new USDC into circulation, whereupon we credit your customer account. Note that you can basically at any point, as I said, go in reverse, because as I mentioned, we have one-to-one -one reserves that are always, always liquid. So the opposite process would be decrediting your account and what Circle will do is burn USDC, which means to remove some USDC from circulation, at which point you receive back your fiat. One important distinction to note here in this slide is there's a barrier to entry, so you'll notice that the on-ramp process may potentially be slow. It might take anywhere from you know one to four days, maybe five days, depending on how your fiat on-ramp process works. Right, so as I mentioned, the legacy payment rails are slow. But I want to point out really, really strongly here that that is the only barrier to entry. Once you've on-ramped your fiat successfully, you're now open to the entire ecosystem of decentralized apps and businesses. So every transaction that you do with USDC is very, very fast. If you don't believe me, these are some numbers taken from Circle's official documentation for transaction times that you can expect with USDC. If you look here on the left, Solana <laughs> takes 400 milliseconds to settle with USDC. That is less than half a second, everybody. That's very, very fast. And on the very slow end of things, on Ethereum, at the worst case, really on a regular day, you can expect your transaction with USDC to finalize within six minutes. And really, you know, in the worst, worst case of a reorg happens, you might have to wait a few hours, but Hey, honestly, that beats waiting two or three days for a traditional wire transfer, am I right? So really, it is very fast. And even in the middle, you know, Algorand, five seconds. I can shake my friend's hand and say, hey, how are you? How are you doing today? In about five seconds. That's how fast it is. At this point, I've given you some basic information about USDC, what it is, how it works. And second, we're here at a dev conference. So I want to talk to you about what matters in terms of technical specs when it comes to building and launching a trusted stablecoin like USDC. So let's go ahead and deep dive into some of the requirements that we at Circle really care about for such an implementation. And again, as I go through the second section, I really, really want you to think about the utility of a trusted stablecoin like this that follow, follows very strict programmatic standards. To start off with, as I'm sure you know, the fact is not all stable coins are created equal, right? Some stables really, really hate the idea of centralization and they'll work with DAOs, with any kind of entity to make sure that their coins are very, very de decentralized because frankly, there's a lot of distrust around central governments and governance, right? On the other hand, some, you know, some stables really, really care about centralization, right? Which, which is, kind of antithetical when you think about the fact that crypto was developed exactly for the reverse of that, right? But here at Circle, we really care and believe in really, really strict requirements. And why do you ask, right? First, trust, as I've been mentioning back and forth throughout this presentation. We believe that, you know, we can't build trust without a trusted product and a specification, even if that comes at the cost of some centralization. And second, visibility and scalability. We really think it's important to think about exactly how a token like this looks 
at the very initial stages rather than you know waiting a year from now, two years from now for legislation to come and thinking about, oh, how do we retrofit our coin to fit the current market space? With that being said, there are six requirements that we have for USDC to be launched on any blockchain. And you'll note that any blockchain has its own token standard. For example, you know, the classic Solidity on Ethereum, ERC-20s, and then Dapper slash Flow has something called Cadence, which is their version of smart contract programming. And Solana has something called the SPL, so the Solana Program Library. So, you know, it's important to note that every single blockchain has a different token standard, but we at Circle will always conform and build on top of that bespoke to make sure that our token fits our requirements. Let's jump into it. We have six specific requirements for any implementation of USDC on a blockchain. The first is the allow slash block list. The second is spending on behalf of an approver. The third is configuring minters. The fourth, multi-signature transactions for security. The fifth, support for cold storage transactions. And lastly, the ability to pause the contract and upgrade it at will. Let's walk through each of these cases. If you're interested in the central repository we have at Center, you can scan that QR code as I explain these requirements. The first is the allow or block list, which makes sure that certain entities can't easily interact with USDC. So if there's a bad actor out there, right, we want to make sure that they cannot conduct any suspicious activities. And what I mean by this is they cannot send, cannot receive, cannot mint, cannot burn, cannot do anything with USDC, essentially. This is, we believe, an important thing for building trust. The second is the spending on behalf of mechanism. So I want to give you some business analogies here in case you're not very familiar with how these mechanisms work. You know, here in the world, there are many businesses that sometimes approve their employees to spend some money for business trips, right? So maybe your company sent you out here with a few hundred bucks on a virtual card or something that you spend on behalf of the company. Similarly here, we allow users who interact with USDC to approve certain addresses, which are then allowed to spend on behalf of the original approver address, right? So this is a very, very interesting use case. Suppose you want to build your business on top of this platform, right? So if you ever have transactions where you do need to approve your employees, you can do so directly with this initial spec that we have. The third mechanism is minter configuration. So the point of this spec, the point of this specific trait is to mitigate the risk of centralization behind who can distribute new USDC. As I've told you before, USDC is always backed one-to-one, -one, so it's always liquid, it's always backed by fiat, now, there may, be, there may be bad actors who are given the ability to mint new USDC, and they may just say, what if I just want to mint a trillion right now? And all of that is a very bad idea because we don't actually have a trillion dollars that lives in a fiat a bank account. So the idea with this is we get to control exactly who distributes and mints new USDC. On top of that, every single one of these minters has the, con the concept of minter allowance, which is exactly how much they're allowed to distribute before they're blocked. So, for example, you might go to a minter and say, hey, I want to allow you to mint up to $200 million of USDC, of liquid USDC. And by the time they reach $200 million, we'll say, hey, you got to come back and we can issue more allowance for you. Right? So I want to bring it back to the point that this specific trait here, minter configuration, is to make sure that we exactly control who gets to distribute new USDC so that the finances are always accurate and safe. So moving on to the latter three requirements that we have. The first is multi-sig transactions. Building onto trust and security here, everybody, we don't want just one single entity that approves a transaction all the time, right? So maybe sometimes you have a business case where there's a sensitive transaction through which you need five of six signatures from the executive board of your company before it's allowed to go through, right? So in this case, we want to allow at least K of N signatures based on the private keys. And again, it's all based on trust. Tying into this point, the fifth requirement we have is cold storage support. So you don't always want to have your funds 
right, on a hot wallet like your MetaMask Chrome extension, right? Some businesses might want to do a recurring thing where they say, hey, we want to pay our employees in USDC on the first of every month, right? And to make their lives easier, they could just build these transactions in advance and request that they be broadcasted a month later, right? So for any implementation of USDC, this cold storage support is critical. There has to be some way for us to create transactions offline, sign them, and then later have them be broadcasted in hot mode. And that's very important to us. And lastly, what would software be without the ability for maintenance, right? So this goes into the sixth concept, pausing and upgrading. The idea of pausing is essentially just freezing the contract at any point. So in case there's an emergency or you know, we need to make sure that our systems are up to date, you essentially have the power to freeze the contract. This does not say anything about the funds or the liquidity. It just means that all operations are stopped for a certain amount of time. Right? So it's important to have this ability. And it ties into the last part, which is upgradability. As software engineers and architects, we know that you know, any software cannot just always stay at V1 for the entirety of its life cycle for decades. Right? So here at Circle, we use a, a pattern called delegate call-based proxies. I want to give an analogy for this really quickly. Essentially, you know, when you're at a bank and you request some cash, right, from, uh, you know, a really large amount of cash, you can't easily do that at an ATM. <laughs> you can't request $10,000 at an ATM. So you go to the teller and you ask them to it on behalf of you. So similarly here, when we upgrade USDC, we deploy a new V2 or V3 smart contract that then sits at the very front and users are the ones who interact with this V2 layer which then delegates all the calls to the underlying V1 implementation. So that's a quick summary of what this delegate call-based proxy pattern looks like. So to tie, to tie it up, we've now covered the six, straight, six traits that are required for any USDC implementation. This is a static hard requirement, and it does not change depending on which blockchain we choose to launch on. As you can see, right, there's a lot to the implementation of a trusted stablecoin like USDC. It's very strict. It can sometimes feel overbearing because of how centralized it seems, but we do it all in the best interest of our customers and our regulators. At this point, first, we've covered the broad USDC concept, and you've seen its utility as a foundational piece that can empower businesses in this new digital age. Secondly, we've also looked at the requirements that Circle has for launching such a stablecoin. And you've seen how much we really care about building a trusted product that's fleshed out in the best interest of our customers. Third and lastly, I want to give you a little snippet into the future. So, USDC and beyond. Starting with the USDC front, as you know, we're at 51.7 billion market cap now as of September 2022. We expect a lot more growth in the future as we continue to evolve our product strategy. And for those wondering, USDC is not our only product. There we have many more products. So, in fact, a clear sign of USDC success is its current adoption at a lot of real merchants. There are coffee shops, like the one I mentioned on the first slide, that now use USDC to settle all their transactions. This is the power of Web3. And here's a banger. Everybody, we're in Lisbon, Portugal. I'm giving you a talk <laughs> about something called USDC. You might be asking, why is he on the stage talking about something called the US dollar coin when we're here in Europe? And I want to give you one last piece. There is, in fact, a coin called Eurocoin. Circle launched Eurocoin at the end of June 2022. For more information, you can go to circle.com slash Eurocoin it's based on the entire spec that I've given you throughout this entire talk, which means it's essentially a complete replica of the current trusted standard that we have for USDC. All the features, all the liquidity, all the backing, it's all there. As of now, in September 2022, there are over 75 million euros in circulation in the form of Eurocoin. We're very excited to see where this goes, and we hope you are too. If you're interested, we really like our developers to get their hands dirty. We offer a sandbox API suite that you can use now as immediately after this talk. 
You can sign up for an account today, and it'll behave just like it does on mainnet. It's a testnet environment with all fake money, so you can really, really play around and try out our business suite. This will help you learn how to on-ramp your potential business case if you need it, and you'll get all the features of production. And when the time comes, you can contact our sales to actually sign up for the real deal. We're really excited about how you can use our Sandbox APIs to seamlessly integrate the future of digital money into your own use cases. We really are excited for you to come build with us. At Circle, we have one mission, to raise the global economic prosperity of everybody through the frictionless exchange of financial value. I want to say that again. We're here raising global economic prosperity through frictionless exchange of financial value. I think that's a pretty great mission. And one last thing. If you're excited, Circle is hosting another crypto conference in San Francisco, in the Bay Area, two weeks from now, September 27th to 30th. You should totally come because speakers like Vitalik, the founder of Ethereum, are going to be there, and Serena Williams, tennis champion. And there may be some interesting near protocol news to share at Circle Converge. Thank you so much. Long, thank you so much. What a great talk. Thank you. It's always so great to hear about uh, how these new forward-thinking Web3 projects are working together with uh, existing systems, with governments, the US government, and now uh, the European Union. And we're, we're integrating these fiat currencies that you know people who aren't involved in Web3 might not completely understand what gives a Bitcoin value? What gives a near token value? But they understand that a dollar has value. They understand that a euro has value. So these types of on-ramps, these products that Circle is creating are just more great ways to get people who aren't in Web3 yet involved in Web3. All right, so next up, we just have a quick, short 15-minute break. But before you go, I want to tell you about another presentation that's coming up on the Nightshade stage. It's called How Web3 is the New Instrument for Musicians. That's at 4.30. And when we come back here on the Doomslug stage, we are going to be welcoming Josh Ford and Ben Couric from uh, Pagoda to talk about the complete JavaScript workshop for near builders. So don't go too far. Hello everybody, can you hear me? We are not going to be taking our 15 minute break here in the Doomslug stage, and instead we're going to be rolling right into our next presentation. Uh, and so please hang tight for just a few quick minutes while we get that set up for you. Thank you everybody. Thank you. 
Hey, what do I need? What, what do you need to see on my laptop? All right, so in order to get back on track, we're going to cut our 15 minute break short just a little bit. So Josh and Ben, are you guys ready? Hopefully. Uh, yeah, well, we'll see. All right, take it away, guys. Okay, there you go. Slideshow. Okay, first of all, can, uh, can everybody hear us? Can you hear me? Relatively fine, you can, can you hear, hear me? me? They can nice. hear us. This All is right. so this strange. Is yeah, it is weird. Like, people can hear it in the silent I know. disco. Is anyone right? going to dance? All right. Um, cool. <laughs> All right. I'll pass it on to Josh. All right, cool. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, ben and Josh, we are from near... Oh, you can't hear me. Oh, you don't have your headset he, he, in. You need a headset, sir. It's the silent disco. Yes. Yes, silent. So, All right. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, we're Ben and Josh from near... Um, we work at Pagoda, actually, but we do a lot of near ecosystem developer relations uh, stuff. And uh, yeah, this is Ben. You want to say a little bit about yourself, Ben? Yeah, how's it going? So developer relations engineer. Uh, I'm the co-founder of FAIR, which is actually launching today, which is pretty interesting. Uh, I created KeyPalm, which is all the NFT ticketing that uh, if anyone went to any of the parties or will go to any of the parties and get any POAPs here at, uh, at NearCon, uh, that's all done through KeyPalm with uh, Matt Locke here. Currently studying University of Waterloo Engineering over in Canada, and, uh, and I'm pretty passionate about innovation and technology. Awesome. My name is Josh. Uh, I started my IT career a while ago in 2003. I uh, did tech support and network administration. Uh, and then in 2006, I traded glass blowing lessons for web design, um, doing like Macromedia Dreamweaver uh, stuff. So I was kind of coding, but not really. Uh, and then in 2015, I was a full time glass blower for many years. And then in 2020, I decided to return to tech in a creative role, did a six month boot camp, and then Near hired me on uh, as a, a 40 year old junior dev. And I've been uh, plugging away ever since and been here for about two years. And now, uh, um, yeah, I was on the DevX team and now I'm a team lead for developer relations. So yeah, why JavaScript? Like why did we create this thing? Uh, and we believe that it's the language for mass adoption. We really want to have JavaScript or near, or, I'm sorry, Web3 be something that is really accessible to everyone. Uh, and in order to, to do that, we've decided to really develop a software development kit around a language that many are familiar with. Uh, so many that about 20 million developers can actually read and write JavaScript code. So it's really trying to like have the barrier for entry really minimized. Um, easy onboarding for Web2 devs that are curious about the Web3 space. Um, and then being able to do like a full stack app, build, adapt in a singular familiar language. Um, so yeah, can build, test, deploy all in one stack. Can you actually hold on to that for a second? Um, so yeah, what is the JavaScript stack? Basically you have, um, so like building smart contracts, we'll have near SDK JS, that's building your smart contract. Uh, Workspaces JS will allow you to test your uh, smart contract. Um, you can actually use it for any WASM deployed uh, smart contract. Um, but we also have near CLI that allows you to deploy, build, interact with the blockchain, and that's actually a wrapper that's on top of near API JS. Um, similar to Web3 JS if you're familiar with that ecosystem, but yeah, near API JS just allows you to um, plug into the blockchain and interact with it, making RPC calls. Uh, and then, yeah, the wallet selector. Um, we're moving away from just having one wallet uh, be the only wallet that dApps use to sign in and use. And we're now starting to use wallet selector that allows people to choose from a list of um, uh, wallets that you as a developer can choose which ones you want your app to use. Cool. Um, so this is the Pagoda Workshop resources. If you want to like 
click on this and scan it with your phone. I'll give a, a second. Um, this will take you to like a basic link tree. It'll show you the presentation slides, a getting started guide, uh, the workshop example, uh, the repo directly. Um, and uh, yeah, it's got all that, all that information. Uh, I think cameras are down. Everyone kind of got that link. Awesome, cool. So let's, let's get into the coding. Is this the screen that you want me to be on? Yeah, or yeah, just go into the file. Okay. And then switch the branch. So, uh, so yeah, let's code. Um, so going, to, going over to this, uh, this QR code here, so it's over here, pagoda.co forward slash JS workshop. Um, and so what we're gonna be using here is this, uh, where is it? The workshop example project. So clicking on this, it'll send us over to our handy dandy GitHub repository over here. So this is essentially uh, what we're gonna be using for the presentation. There's a couple of ways that you can follow along if you want to. For those watching at home and watching on YouTube, you can either, uh, you can use Gitpod, which is down here over in the, in the README, or you can just straight up clone and, uh, and, and work locally, which is what we're gonna do for the purpose of the presentation. So let's go ahead and let's copy that clone link. And then let's, uh, where are we right now? Okay, so let's make a directory called uh, Nearcon. Nearcon. And then we'll CD into Nearcon. And then this is where we're gonna clone uh, that workshop. And then once that is finished and the Wi-Fi is all fine and dandy, we're gonna CD into that directory. Come on, Wi-Fi. It's not it's a like, big it's like repo. Dial -up speeds, nice. Yeah, it's, it's not a big repo, I promise. <laughs> uh, but yeah, there we go. So now we're in the uh, we're now we're in the repository. So we'll we'll open it up in VS Code. So yeah, and this, uh, yeah, I'll pass it on to Josh yeah, to talk about the file structure. Basically, um, we have two directories here. Uh, front end, for we'll go over in a little bit, how do you connect your app. And then we have the source directory, uh, and that has your smart contract. Um, and if you open up the package.json, you can see the only dependency that um, we're using for the smart contract development is near SDK.js. Um, so yeah, if you want to open up the source directory, this is basically an entire smart contract. Um, you have your normal imports that you would do um, from your dependency near SDK.js, um, a class, uh, it's got a constructor, and then you scroll down a little bit, and we have two methods here, um, just basically two JavaScript functions, set and a greeting and viewing a greeting. It's basically gonna set a string on the, on the blockchain and then return that value. And we have a couple of decorators above it. Um, so yeah, Ben, you want to dive into exactly what all these imports are and what, what they're doing? Sure, yeah. So uh, at first glance, this does look eerily familiar to any other TypeScript class that you've written before. The only thing that's different is, uh, is as Josh had mentioned, those imports here coming from the near SDK.js. So more specifically, we've got this near Banjan uh, decorator, which is essentially just, uh, it, it, it creates the glue such that the, the near runtime can, uh, can actually read your contract. We've also got this near contract parent class, which essentially just puts your contract in the correct sort of form, such that it can be read and you know all that all that fun stuff. But other than that, it's it's really pretty simple. We've got this field my greeting, which is a string. We've got a constructor that sets it to a default message. In this case, hello Web3 world, and then we've got what's uh, what's known as a call decorator. So essentially, there, there's two there's two sorts of, uh, of of functions here. We've got a call and a view function. A view function. Uh, you don't need to sign the transaction. It's, everything's free. It essentially allows you to just retrieve information from on-chain. You don't need an account or anything like that. So it, it, you can think of it just as a, as a getter. Uh, it's pretty, pretty familiar if, you're, if, you, uh, if you know Ethereum. But, uh, and then we've got this call decorator here. This has to be signed because you're changing information on chain. So in this case, we pass in a message and we change what's actually stored on our contract. So it's a, it's a call decorator. It needs to be signed. It costs gas, all that stuff. You need to pay for it. Pretty cheap, but, uh, but yeah, so you can't just call this, call this contract and this function with no account. But, um, but yeah, and then in order to build, we'll run, this, uh, we'll run a pretty handy dandy build script that we've got over here, which is simply, is essentially just runs near SDKJS build and then pass in the directory for the contract. So if I go up to my terminal and I run a yarn build, actually, no, yarn build contract. We don't want to build the web just yet. Oh, no, we have to install dependencies first. <laughs> always forget oh, that one. Yeah, always forget to install the dependencies. Hopefully it won't take too long with our dial-up connection. Yeah, the Wi-Fi is <laughs> not, uh, not too hot here, but... 
hopefully shouldn't take too long. One thing uh, in, in the contract that Ben was working on, uh, you'll notice that it actually is written in TypeScript. Um, you can do TypeScript or JavaScript. We chose to do that. It makes the development process easier. Uh, but it is one thing to note that once you compile it, um, it will just compile whatever you're using to JavaScript before it goes to a WASM file that'll be deployed on the blockchain. Yeah, when I when I develop, I tend to, to not like having bugs in my contract. So TypeScript personally types just helps nice. me. You yeah. know, types are nice. I types agree. Types are super nice. I, you know what else is nice? This uh, finishing. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Ah, uh, dependencies, dependency, dependency. The Wi-Fi is, is unfortunate. But uh, essentially what this is going to do is it's going to compile our contract down to Wasm, and it's going to store, uh, when we run the, the command, of course, it's going to create a build folder where it's going to store our, uh, our contract code that's then going to be deployed to the blockchain. Um, yeah, if you want to open up those scripts, maybe we could talk a little bit more about the... So yeah, under the scripts, what we're doing right now is we're building the contract. Uh, like Ben said, it's going to export it into a directory uh, as a WASM file. And then um, we're going to deploy this contract. Um, and under the deploy, um, is, it, is it done? Is it done? Uh, oh, oh six, 627. Two out of four packages fetched. All right. Holy moly. We didn't, we didn't uh, uh, account for uh, dependency. <laughs> dependency ins installed. Well, it's not that big. It's just the it's just the Wi-Fi. Oh, All right. we're getting there. Woo. All right, we're almost there. We're almost there. It's the finish line. <laughs> finish strong. <laughs> this is going to be the entire presentation. It's just it's installing just, dependencies. Just, it's just installing dependencies and waiting. Um, yeah. So there are a, <laughs> a bunch of scripts. Maybe you could open up the. Uh, yeah, yeah. To the right, so we can watch the the uh, build. Yeah. So if you look at these depend, um, sorry, these scripts that we created in here, um, you can you can really just start this by go, doing like a, a, a yarn start or yarn deploy, and what that'll do is it'll build it. It'll you see um, on the deploy line, it'll remove a near that that RMRF near dev. It'll get rid of your developer or, um, uh, or your dev account if you have one, and then it'll create a new one build it, and then deploy that contract uh, out onto that developer account. Um, also setting some contract variables, or some, uh, exporting some variables in your uh, terminal that'll help for ease of use during development. So that way, instead of writing your entire developer string uh, as a contract uh, ID, you can just call the contract name. I'm going to see if I can hotspot my computer and see if that works, because this Wi-Fi is a little bit atrocious right now. Oh my lord. So yeah, you guys enjoying Nearcon? Pretty crazy, huh? <laughs> I've run into a lot of issues, but I've never run into this yeah, Wi Fi. Into, yeah, the Wi Fi d dependency issues. Yeah, it's good good to know for next time. Alright, awesome. Looks like you're your phone is uh, running a little bit quicker here. Oh, man. So how's your day been? It's been, it's been good. It's been pretty it's been good. good. Yeah, yeah. you staying dry? Yeah. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> this is unfortunate. Oh. It's faster, oh, looks it's like. it's faster. It's actually doing it. It's doing things. Um, yeah, maybe while it's waiting, can we? I'm trying to think if we can talk about. Oh, the suspense is killing me. I know. Got the HDMI issue, and uh, now this. There oh! you go. 86 seconds. Holy yeah, Lord. thank you, thank you, Woo. thank you, thank you, thank you. All right. Nice. So, we got to uh, build suspense, you know. It's all a part of a good demo. Yeah. 
Cool. So we deployed. Uh, no, we built the contract. Yes. Did we build it? Or we didn't build it yet. Yeah, we just no, no, no. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now we want to build good, it. Good point. Go. Good point. Yeah, good we call. have to actually build it now. Now we're going to build the contract. All, All right. right. Cool. Woo. All right. All right. Building. This shouldn't be too long. No, no. This shouldn't, this shouldn't take too long. Yeah. But th essentially, this is just compiling it down to Wasm, and it's going to store it in this build directory here when that's done. So you've got... Uh, You've got all of the, the J. Oh, there we go. And nice. then we've got our contract out Wasm. Woo, Amazing. We got a Wasm file. All right, there we go. Great. So let's uh, let's actually deploy this on chain. So rather than going through the whole account creation process and all that stuff, I'm just going to uh, to do what's called a dev deploy. So I'm going to do a near dev deploy and then build slash contract out Wasm. So oh, I need to not be on mainnet. <laughs> I wish you could uh, do a dev deploy on mainnet. That'd be that'd be amazing. Yeah. <laughs> but but yeah. So this is going to spin up a, an account like dev dash something dash something, as you can see over here. Basically built on like a timestamp. Yeah, and then uh, this is where our contract is deployed to. And if we open up the explorer link here, you'll see. Um, if you open up the explorer link here, you'll go. see that the contract was deployed and that everything was successful. Nice. So that's quick. So now I know near is pretty fast. It's eh? pretty fast. So now let's uh, let's export contract name and then we'll do dev yeah and but i'm i'm not gonna write it all out boom and now we've got it on our environment variable so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna initialize the contract so we'll do a near call contract name new and then if we uh do this and then we'll sign it as the uh the contract Why are we initializing the contract, Ben? So we initialize the con great question. Thank you. <laughs> we initialize the contract so that we can store the default message that we had that we, that we had done over here. So the constructor essentially is setting the greeting to Hello Web Three World. So in case you forgot in that uh, ten minute build dependency section, the contract just <laughs> stores a string on chain, and it, by default it's Hello Web Three World. And then you can set it, and then you can also get uh, that message. Oh, method not found. That's because Ooh. it's in it. And it's user error. User error, indeed. And there we go. Nice. So now, if we go and we query for the message that's currently stored by calling the view greeting function, so near view, and then we'll do the contract name, and then we'll do view greeting. Then we see hello Web3 world. Awesome. Amazing. Well, so let's how go. How do you change it? That's what I was going to do right oh. now. So we'll do a near call this time, but rather than doing init, we'll call this method set greeting. So we'll do set greeting, and then I'll pass in a message, and then we'll say, uh, I don't know, go team. Nice, I love that. I know. Great mantra. Oh, you forgot the exclamation point. I did? Oh. You have to go team. All right, all right, it's all right. It's super important. All right. Yes. And then I'll sign it as the contract again. Contract underscore name. So what this is going to do is it's going to take that go team string and it's going to pass it into the function and it's going to get set on chain. And here you can see nice. we've got a log saving greeting go team. So if we go ahead and we view the greeting again, we've got go team. All right. Awesome. There you go. That was live on chain. That just happened just like that. And it's a JavaScript contract. Yeah. Look at that. Pretty, pretty amazing. Yes. I, I see you. I like it. Nice. <laughs> All right. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and we're actually going to code a contract from scratch. So cool. as I'm uh, checking out, Josh, you can talk a little bit about what it is. Yeah, so what we're going to do is we're going to create a really simple game, coin flip game. Uh, it's going to get a random uh, random number. Oh, and actually you already got it up. Yeah, that's so quick. I know. That's so quick. So we checked out a new branch. Um, this is a skeleton branch, and it allows you to kind of like, we're going to set up the structure for you, and you can just kind of fill in as you want if you're coding along out in the audience. Uh, but like as you can see, exact same imports that we did before. Uh, only this time at the very top, uh, before you go through, we uh, have a function here and we're generating a random number. Uh, you can't do math.random um, because blockchain. So what we have to do uh, is do we do a random seed and then we just, it's going to be either a zero one at the um, uh, character, at the first character. And um, it, we're going to get a random number and see if it's zero one. And then we're going to, that'll be the coin flip. Or that, that'll be the, uh, the random number that we'll, we'll play the game against. So yeah, basically same kind of structure, only this time we're instantiating points, which is an empty object. Within that empty object, we're gonna just basically keep track of whatever we want, but for this game, it's gonna be name of the person that um, is playing the game, and then how many points they have. Um, and then we also are gonna instantiate points 
as, uh, oh, yep, we do it right there under the constructor. Cool. Awesome. Cool. So, yeah, right. this is basically same as before where we have a call method and a view method. We're going to view the points, and then we're also going to call the contract, flip a coin, and pass either heads or tails as a string. So, yeah, do you want to go ahead and... Yeah, I'll, I'll get started. Yeah, so, so the two functions here are view points and, and flip coins. So for view points, you're going to pass in a player, so in an account ID, and then it's going gonna, it's gonna to return how many points that player has. And then flip coin, you pass in either heads or tails. And depending on whether you got it right or not, you'll get a, a point added to your account. So let's start with the, with the view points function here. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to check, first of all. So I'll say if. First, I'm just going to check if they're in the map already. So if this dot points that has own property at the player. So if they exist, then I'm just gonna return this dot points at the player. And then else, I'm just gonna return null if they don't exist yet, right? So if, if you're trying to view points of someone who, who's, who's never played before, we'll just return null. Uh, it's pretty simple, right? And then, uh, and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna do the flipping coin mechanism here. So if we think about maybe the workflow of how this is gonna work, Right? The very first thing we're going to need is we're going to need to know who called the function, right? Because they're the person that's playing. And so to do that, we've got this handy dandy near object that's being imported from the near SDKJS. And it has a bunch of important information that you can use when writing your contract. For example, who called the function? How much near did they attach? How much gas did they attach? All that kind of good stuff. So we'll use that to our advantage. So we'll say let, we'll say the player is equal to near dot predecessor account ID. So that's just who called the function, right? And then what we're going to do is we're going to check if they don't exist. So if this.points has own property, if they do not exist, then we're just going to set them equal to zero points, right? And then what we're going to want to do is uh, let's add a log. So oftentimes when, when doing smart contract development, logging is really important because if anything goes wrong, you can view it in the Explorer. It's just like, uh, like regular logging in any application. And to do that on near, rather than doing console.log, you can use the near object. So we'll do near.log and we'll say maybe player and then we'll say chose side for an example, right? And then what we're going to want to do is we're going to get the random number. So we'll say maybe const random num, and then we'll set it equal to generate random number. So this will return either a zero or a one at complete random uh, behavior. And so because we're writing the contract, we have full reign over what that means. So in this case, maybe we'll say that uh, if it's false, we'll set that to heads. But if it's not false, we'll set that to tails. Or sorry, if it's zero, then, uh, then we're going to set that to, uh, to heads. So we'll say let outcome. So if random number is equal to zero, then we'll say heads, but else we'll say tails, right? Uh, actually, no, this returns a Boolean, so we'll say false. And then from there, we've got our outcome. And so what we need to do is we need to check if the side that they passed in is equal to that outcome. So we'll say if the side that they chose is equal to the outcome, right, then they should win a point. So we'll do a near.log. And we'll say, you get a point. Hooray. <laughs> right? And then what we're going to do is we're going to do this dot points at the player is equal to whatever their points were plus one. But the unfortunate side of things is if their side was not equal to the outcome, we'll say near dot log, you lost a point. Dot, 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 dot. Always add more dots. And then what we're going to do is we're going to get their points. But rather than just decrementing their points, let's say you're on a crazy loss streak. You just started. You just started playing. You're at zero, and you, and you lose 15 times in a row. I think that that's kind of demoralizing personally. So what we're going to do is we're just going to say it's going to be equal to. So if they already have zero points, sorry, is equal to. If this is already zero, then we're just going to keep them at zero. But else. We're just gonna we're gonna subtract one from their points, just so that they don't feel upset for playing, and uh, and that's that. I think it's a, a pretty simple smart contract, right? So we coded the view method and we coded the uh, the flipping method. So let's go ahead and let's uh, let's build. So maybe one thing we should do is um, tell them what the result was, so that way we don't think we're cheating them. 
We could, oh, yeah, yeah. we near could say, you could say. Uh, in the near log. Yeah, yeah. You lost the point. The result was. Sure. Just so you make sure. The result was. And then outcome. Outcome. You do the same for, you got a point. And then we'll just copy this bad boy here. Cool. And there. And then one log, I think in the call method, or in the view method, uh, returning a log. And then what your player is, or is it fine? Yeah, I think it's okay. fine for now. Um, but yeah, so that's the contract. And then what we're going to do is we're going to build it, but there's this neat deploy script. Josh, I'll let you talk about that while it runs. So yeah, basically it's going to do exactly what it did before, only this time it's going to also set your environment variable, build the contract, export it, um, create a dev account, fund the dev account, uh, deploy it on that dev account, then set the uh, contract to, or the environment variable on your uh, command line to that contract. Um, and then it's initiating it as well, right? Yeah, it'll, it'll also going to auto init the... You can see um, here, yeah. Yep. It's initiating the account, so you don't have to do that. Basically going to do everything, all the things, and now it should be ready to go. So if I echo the contract here, um, well, let's, let's, let's do it anyway done, here. Done, done. Export. So now uh, that it's initialized, let's, let's maybe flip a coin. So I'll do a near call on the contract. I think it was called flip coin, right? I believe so. Yeah, flip coin. And we're going to pass in a, uh, a side here. So how about, how about we get some audience interaction Come here? How about heads or tails? He hands up for heads. Heads, heads, heads. heads. All right, heads. heads, and heads. Well, you know, well, we, what about tails? tails? Hands up Hands up for tails. Oh, well, the same people <laughs> are doing heads. Uh, heads it it looks like we got two for heads, tails. Let's do all tails. Right, let's do all tails. Right, fine. We'll do tails. You guys are a bunch of cheaters. And then we'll sign. Let's let's play. Let's play under my personal account ID. Of course. So you get the points. I want the all points. Right, I want yeah. all the points. All the karma. All the points. Yeah. It goes right to Ben. <laughs> all right. So we're, we're, we're flipping. <laughs> Drum roll. Do an account. I uh, lost. Oh. oh, I got a point. Yeah, there oh, you yay. go. Yay, we got a point. Uh, Woo, we won. Let's do it again. <laughs> I want more points. <laughs> First time we did this at Consensus, was it like 10 times in a row we lost? <laughs> yeah, but I'm, I'm on a win streak <laughs> like, right not, now. This is not. Oh, you won again. I did. What if I go again? What was it? The result was, was tails. Was tails. Okay. All right. Oh, so I not, lost a point. Cheating. Oh, we All right. lost. We lost. So we now lost. if we view our points. Yeah, let's see what our points are. We should so have one, we'll do, right? uh, I think two, view points. Two minus one is one. I think so. <laughs> I think maybe. I can't math very well. View points, but. and we'll do player, and then my personal account. Of course. Oh, you didn't pass. You didn't put another. Uh, you forgot a. Um, yes. Uh, there you go. Thank you, you. you. Yeah. And we got one point. There Whoa, you go. One awesome. Point. All right. So that's it. That's uh, that's an easy kind of game that you can create with JavaScript on the blockchain. Pretty rad. Um, we were gonna yeah. go do the front end. We were gonna spin up the oh, front yeah, end, but we're running out of time. But unfortunately, it looks like we're we're running out of I think time. We're so running out of time to so go maybe. The front end. But you know what? You can actually check us out. We're gonna be doing office hours the entire time. And actually, I'm gonna go to that in a slide. Um, so yeah, maybe bring up our slides. Um, yeah, and then let's do the last couple slides in our couple minutes that we have. So yeah, feedback and suggestions. We definitely want to you know, shape this tool uh, on the community needs and what you guys um, and gals like would like to see. So we're trying to drive all the traffic to our GitHub repository. So in that um, QR code that you scanned earlier, it takes you right to the repo. Please click on the discussions button, give us some feedback, you know, what, what do you like, what do you don't like, the good, the bad, the ugly, all that stuff. Um, there's actually even like a show and tell button at the bottom, like show us your project, like showcase what you're actually building. We'd like to see it. Um, yeah, right there at the bottom. Uh, you go, the, go to the, the next slide. Um, yeah, any issues or bugs? We actually have an issue and bug bounty as part of the hackathon. Uh, it's a new uh, library, new tool, so we really want to get you know uh, as many people as we possibly can uh, to help us find these bugs and squash them. So yeah, uh, report any issues that you have there. Again, we're just trying to drive traffic and communication to the repo itself, so that way we can interact with those individuals. Uh, and uh, whoop. Oh, yeah, one last time for anyone that didn't get it. I put the slide up there twice. I forgot about that, but just QR code. Any, oh, yeah, a couple people, a couple. Yeah, nice, nice. Hey, I got two minutes. I know you're looking at me like. <laughs> it says two minutes on the thing, Jake. <laughs> um, need help. Uh, if you want to scan this, 
uh, you can ask us. Uh, the whole there's like a ton of near engineers that are here. Pagoda, near protocol. We have a ton of engineers that are here willing to help you with your projects. Come to the Pagoda booth, uh, ten, like pretty much all day. There will always be someone there uh, willing to answer a call. Uh, and then in the Hackers Den, 15 p.m. to 17 p.m. I don't think we need p.m. after. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I got one minute and 22 seconds. Oh, oh yeah. all right. I don't have it. <laughs> there's also lanyards. Yeah, of, um, yeah, I guess there's lanyards of people that can help you ans answer questions on the JavaScript stuff. I didn't know about that. Thank you. Thank you very much. No pictures, please. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, again, we're just here to get feedback. Um, we're really excited about this new tool. We really think it's going to open up a lot of individuals to build uh, on Near. Um, and yeah, Pagoda's making some cool stuff. They're the original engineers that created the protocol and continue to build the tooling for it and to be the major contributors towards it. So we're yeah, we're stoked to be here. We're stoked to see this yeah event grow in, in the way it's been. And yeah, reach out to one of us after the event. Got Go team. 30 seconds left. Don't really have any questions. Perfect. So. That's, that about he, does he has it. a question, oh, so maybe question? Right. thirty seconds. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, that function can generate uh? na generate number. Is it a JavaScript I function? I can't. Can you, I can't can you hear him. Oh, <laughs> this is oh, a weird this is better. Disco thing. Yeah. Sorry. Hello, everyone, guys. Okay. So thanks, thank you very much for the presentation. Just one quick question: Is it function? It was just a JavaScript function, or what? What generate number? The generate yeah, the generate. Yeah, so that was a JavaScript function, but it was using a near primitive, which was getting a, a random seed. Can, can you show it? Yeah. Um, you want to go back? Three. Oh, we're over now. Now it's now it's counting up. No, but here we we got the function right here. We're we're perfect, okay. right? All right, perfect. Yeah, this yeah. is the function right here. So that it's it's yeah, it's just a a, a plain JavaScript function uh, that's using the near import. Uh, from the near SDKJS, that cool. near object, yeah, and it's so used in the in the body of the. Of the you can't just contract. do math .random, uh because blockchain. I'm not exactly sure. I need to find out from. They, there's something about like the genesis, and it just always is the same every single time yeah. you do math random. So yeah. Thanks. Cool. cool. All right. All right. Thank you. We did it. Thank you very much, everyone. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. What a great presentation, and what a great new project they're working on for the near ecosystem. I'm sitting over here, and I'm like pointing to my badge because we have this uh, near JS SDK tactical support team. So if you see anyone with this badge running around, there are a lot of us uh, wearing this badge over uh, by the hackathon. You can ask us about the new JavaScript SDK because it's really, really cool, and we want a lot of people to use it. I mean, as you saw, it's dead simple. If you know JavaScript, if you're Web2 native, well, guess what? We just made you Web3 native. <laughs> All right. Thank you guys so much. That was uh, Josh and Ben from Pagoda DevRel. Next up, we have, oh, actually, before I announce our next speaker, uh, just a quick reminder on the Layer 1 stage, we have a really great panel called the Near DeFi Ecosystem. That's at 5 p.m. if you want to go and check out that. Um, otherwise, our next speaker here is talking about high standards, how Pagoda is decentralizing near development. And that is from Ori A. Take it away. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Can you all hear me OK? Yes? Perfect. Cool. I'm super excited to be here. My name is Ori Applebaum. And today, I will be sharing with you how Pagoda is working to decentralize near's development. So just a little bit about me. I am a technical program manager at Pagoda, and I am based in Portland, Oregon, in the United States. I've been working in the tech industry for over a decade, and I have a lot of experience with uh, agile software development uh, for primarily Web 2.0 uh, SaaS companies. I'm relatively new to the Web 3 space, and I'm super excited to be a part of the community that is uh, shaping it. Uh, just in terms of some of my hobbies, I uh, love to play the piano and compose music. I love to learn languages. I actually speak uh, a little bit of Portuguese, so super excited to practice it this week. And love traveling, cooking, uh, you know, just uh, what, I, what else do I like? Yeah, watching a lot of horrible uh, TV, you know, reality TV shows. So if you want to nerd out about any of those topics or just chat, I will be hanging out in the Pagoda booth and would love to meet you, so please stop by. 
Speaking of Pagoda, just a little bit of background on us. We're the easiest Web3 startup platform there is, and we're the largest contributor to the NEAR protocol. And we recognize that in order to help accelerate the growth and adoption of the NEAR platform, we need to partner with the entire community. So today I'd like to share our proposal for approaching the technical aspects for evolving the ecosystem. So just to go over the agenda, first I will talk about the challenge that we have with decentralizing the NEAR ecosystem. Then I will talk about how we're proposing to solve that from the perspective of developers through developer governance. Next, I will give a quick update on the progress we've been making so far and what to expect next. And lastly, I will talk about how you can get involved. So let's start with decentralization. One of the main challenges uh, with large decentralized ecosystems is balancing the speed of innovation with system reliability. And when we think about evolving the near ecosystem, we want to empower anyone in the community to lead and contribute to innovation. You know, from uh, developing the protocol to defining standards for how apps interface with each other. And we want to ensure system integrity and avoid having a dependency on one entity. So how do we solve this need to innovate, to uh, represent various stakeholders, and to make decisions in a decentralized way. So over the last few months, we've been engaging with the community over this idea of developer governance, which is really about empowering anyone in the community to not only contribute, but also to uh, influence, participate in influencing the future of the ecosystem. And we've been bucketing developer governance into three stages, ideas, voting, and implementation. And I'd like to share with you some of the ways that we've been experimenting in these areas. So let's start with ideas. So we've introduced the NEAR Enhancement Proposal, NEP, to uh, create a way for anyone to submit ideas uh, to, you know, to improve protocol or, or standards. And this is a similar process to uh, prominent open source uh, projects like Rust. And we've already had many NEP submissions. And it's been really incredible just to see the diversity of contribution from the community. And as we've been getting more and more NEPs, we recognize that we need uh, a way to be able to move them forward, to, to review them, to, to make decisions, and determine the next steps so that they're not just sitting uh, indefinitely. So this is where the second voting stage comes in, which involves developers' working groups. Developers' working groups is a way to operationalize the review of NEPs. And the idea is to have multiple working groups, each one focusing on a different ecosystem uh, area and helping make, make decisions and create focus so that we can all move faster. And historically, Pagoda has had a major influence over the design of the ecosystem. And we recognize that while we may not be able to get to decentralization overnight, we can at least take the first step by encouraging uh, you know, leading subject matter experts from Pagoda and other organizations to help bootstrap these first working groups with the community. And so we've already started to do that. We've launched the first uh, contract standards and protocol groups, and we've had a, a couple of meetings to iterate on this process. And putting these groups into practice is going to be a gradual approach uh, and will require flexibility as we learn what works and what doesn't. And as we iterate, we plan to introduce more uh, groups and to uh, empower the community to run them. So just to go into the four uh, roles that are involved in this process. So first is the author. This is the person who submits the NEP and, and presents it to the working group. Next, you have the moderator. This is the, the person who helps facilitate the process and ensure that NEPs are moving forward. Next, you have the reviewer. These are the subject matter experts who assess the technical uh, viability of the NEP. And then lastly, the approver. These are the working group members who help make the decisions. So here's a diagram to illustrate the process. So basically, we have three stages, draft, review, and voting, and two outcomes, approved and rejected. And basically, all the roles that I've mentioned in the previous slide help move the NEP through those stages and towards the outcome. And 
most of the activity happens asynchronously on the NEP itself, which lives on you know, GitHub. But when we do get to the footing stage, each working group has a public meeting in which they review the NEP with the author and they formalize the, de the decision. And I want to highlight that we've really taken the time to think through this process and actually follow it. And we've had various working group members you know, who are following all of the steps and are continuing to iterate. So what happens when NEP get approved? This leads us to the third implementation stage, which is an area that we're still actively uh, experimenting with. But basically, with this new NEP process, we want to encourage more contributions to the implementation, implementation of the near platform by the, the community and to incentivize developers to participate through grants. And we recognize that with centralization, the number of contributions that we can make will plateau over time. But with decentralization, we can scale much faster. And we've already had to, we've started having uh, significant contributions from the community towards implementation, which has been really exciting. In fact, one of the recent NEPs that, that got approved was actually implemented entirely by a community member, which was, which was really exciting. So if you're interested in implementing NEPs, we would definitely love to hear from you. And I'll be sharing a form in the end for, for where you can sign up. So just to put it all together, we have the community who comes up with amazing ideas and submit them through NEPs. Then the working groups who vote on those ideas and, and help move them forward. And then implementers who implement the NEPs for the benefit of the entire community. So I'd like to quickly talk about the progress that we've made so far and what to expect next. So we're already making great strides. As I mentioned, we've launched, launched the first contract standards group back in August, where we reviewed a non-transferable NFT. That particular uh, NEP did not get approved, but the working group members had a really great conversation with the author and gave good feedback. Uh, and then we launched the, the next protocol working group last week in September. Um, and in that meeting, we reviewed efficient signature verification host function, which was approved. And next month, we're kicking off the wallet standards working group in which injected wallet standard will get reviewed. We also have a growing pipeline of NEPs, as I've mentioned. And we hope to see that list continue to grow over time as we get more submissions and participation from the community. So speaking of participation, I'd like to talk about how you can get involved. And there are many ways to do so. so First, if you know what you want to build, you already have something you're super passionate about, please go ahead and submit a NEP. Uh, or you could also join a developer working group to kind of see the, the process and, and learn about other NEPs. And if you don't know what you want to build or you just have some kind of idea in the early phases, uh, I highly encourage you, one way to, to get started is to join com uh, community developer groups. And basically, uh, the developer, sorry, developer community group is really a group of people with a shared interest around the topic. Uh, it can be a, a specific concern or, or problem that they have. It could be an idea or a passion for evolving the ecosystem. And it's really a great way to just start conversations with other folks. And there have been a lot of these types of uh, developer community groups that have started. Uh, in fact, I just ran into Cameron Dennis, uh, who has recently started a wallet standards community group. Uh, and they've already had some meetings. And it's been really, really awesome to, to see that in action. And we want to make it easier for folks to find those groups. So we actually recently added a new section to the, uh, the, the near governance forms in which you can discover those groups more easily and also start one yourself. So you can learn everything about what I covered today uh, on the near.org slash developer uh, governance website. And there's also a sign up form right in the entrance of that website that you can click on and fill it out and express interest in any of the areas that you may want to get involved. But also, I highly encourage you to come check out the Pagoda booth and come chat with me or with Vlad or with any of the Pagoda members. We very much would be excited to, to chat with you and, and work together. So Thank you so much for your time today. And I can't wait to meet you and to decentralize uh, the development of NEAR together. So thanks so much. Ori, thank you so, so much. All right, yes, that was, that was great.
learning about how Pagoda is decentralizing near development. Okay, so next up, we're going to have a panel called Cultivating Your Web3 Talent Pipeline. But while they're setting up the chairs for that, I just have a couple of quick announcements for you all. So uh, first, just a few reminders. We have an ecosystem showcase. Anyone have any idea how many projects are in our ecosystem showcase? Shout out a number. <laughs> Sorry? 100? Not quite 100. We have 30 projects in our ecosystem showcase. And we have 18 projects in our gamers lounge. Um, we also have the uh, sweat, Sweatcoin is here. Sweatcoin is doing an airdrop if you participate in some of their activities. And they have their token generation event, which is occurring in. Anyone have any idea how long it's until their token generation event? 20 hours. <laughs> All right. Uh, then the official NearCon conference, I believe, goes until about 6 p.m. every day. But if you go to nearcon.org, you can see a list of a bunch of side events. So you can party all night long. Uh, yeah, go to nearcon.org, and there's a, uh, a link on the navigation bar there. You can click on side events and check out uh, other events that are going on, satellite events to NearCon. Anyone have any good cryptocurrency jokes? Uh, okay, how about this one? What consensus mechanism does Gordon Ramsay's uh, cryptocurrency use? Proof of stake. <laughs> All right, are we good to go? All right, uh, let me welcome up the panel, Cultivating Your Web3 Talent Pipeline. Everybody. Thank you very much for coming. Hey. Hope you're all enjoying Neocon so far. So we've got a quick panel right now. It's just to talk about the talent happy hour that's going to be going on at 5 p.m. Joined by some fantastic people up on the panel here. Just going to talk about how to cultivate your Web3 talent pipeline, listen to some open roles, and what some of the, the industry leaders look for when looking for talent. So uh, I'll pass over to Ken. So I'm Ken Boggs, and I work for the NEAR Foundation. So as Kobe just mentioned, intention today is get to know some of the projects that are hiring in the ecosystem. As we've mentioned, there's a happy hour. It's actually already kicking off, but the real fun starts in about 13 minutes. So we'll go ahead and get through today and get to know some of our projects that are hiring. Julie. I'm from Pagoda, I'm the COO. Can you guys hear me? Can you guys hear me okay? Okay, awesome. Um, and. Uh, as far as what we look for in candidates, um, honestly, I would say the biggest piece is uh, kind of the thirst for knowledge and willingness to learn. Um, we, uh, yes, we're building highly technical products, but fun fact, most of our devs are from Web 2 with little to no Web 3 experience, and they learn it on the job. And, um, and that's pretty much expected right now because the space is still so nascent. Um, but yeah, so in addition to that, um, outside of our technical roles, um, being an owner, uh, being a problem solver, and being a team player. So I would say, yeah, kind of in a nutshell, that's what we look for. Hello, does it work? Good. Hi, I am Titus. I am a co-founder and CTO of Antisocial Labs. Does it not? Okay. Um, we, we are a dev house. We build cool things for others and also for ourselves. Essentially, if you're a dev, we are quite likely to want to hire you. As uh, her, we do most, like, most of our devs are Web2 devs transitioning into Web3, especially if you're on the front end, like, the, especially on near, picking up what, what you need to know as a dev is, is fairly easy. Obviously, if you're a smart contract dev, we want to work with you if you, uh, 
if you are, have a background in data engineering, we have built our own data product that we need more people to maintain and work on because the requests just keep coming in. So if you're a dev, you comment that build cool things with us. Hey everyone, my name is Anton. Uh, I'm leading uh, integrations at Aurora. Digit and EVM is a scalability solution built on top of Miro. Off. Yeah. Hey, okay, that's better. Hello everyone, my name is Anton Paisov. I'm leading integrations at Aurora. And uh, yeah, uh, in terms of hiring and in terms of culture, the main principle that we operate is the, the extreme ownership one, where you uh, always like own everything, not only what you do, but everything that is affecting your mission to be successful. And uh, yeah, uh, and it's also all about uh, very uh, high pressure, uh, uh, high paced environment working here. Hey, my name is Herman. I'm blockchain architect of Orderly. Uh, we are building the trading infrastructure, and actually, we are looking for two types of the candidates. So, as we have the hybrid ecosystem and hybrid model, we have off chain part and on chain part, and actually, for the off chain part, which is more like the financial base, we are looking for guys who are more like looking to into every piece, uh, care about the security very much. And for the blockchain part with the smart contracts, we are more looking at uh, some kind of creativity and courage. So this is it. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Steven, or if you're into Near NFT's cat, uh, I work for a web free marketing agency it's called Zebu Digital. We're currently about 40 people going up to 50, and this is where we're looking here to try to bring on that next level of ta talent to take us to the next stage. We're gunning to be the number one marketing agency in Web3, and one of the powerful ways you get there is through talent. And as a very fast-paced industry and a fast-paced company, that's one of the things that we're always looking for. As you mentioned before, it's the pressure. You've got to be able to move quickly. You've got to be able to work in the different departments. So across our company, we have five different key service lines that we offer between design, editorial content, events. So we're hosting a, a whole conference uh, next week in London called Zebu Live. Uh, we've also got our whole social media team and a whole range of things that we're looking to expand upon in terms of the growth sort of sector. And for us, it's that versatility, somebody who can have multiple conversations with multiple different people and be able to continue to build upon that. So really looking forward to be able to get into the talent hour as well. I think that's going to be really awesome to meet everybody and have a really good sort of time. So, uh, yeah, just before we get into the happy hour, you may have seen the name scattered around the event a little bit. Uh, founder of B Experience, we're essentially building like a LinkedIn style business network that helps to facilitate the learning and hiring for some of our partners up here and anyone looking to get into the space. So feel free to check us out. We'll be at the happy hour. Please come along and say hello and uh, looking forward to seeing you all there. But thanks very much for coming out. So this is just a few of the projects in the NIR ecosystem that are hiring. There's a number of them that'll be joining us outside in the happy hour. If you haven't found where the happy hour is, it's straight to the end of the building. Go towards Sale GP booth and keep going. Like I said, there's a number of people there and we're excited to get to know you. Thank you very much for joining. Yeah, absolutely. It's like a speed run, bro. Right?